Good. Hopefully, everything- hello Hopefully and welcome to another wonderful episode of Lore Beards, where we sit down by the fireside and have a lovely chat about big fat goblins. Woo! The fattest of goblins. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to today's one, largely because Grom the Paunch is probably the first goblin warlord I ever used on the battlefield. I uh, used an orc and goblin army of, with other people previous to that in previous editions of Warhammer. So we're talking Warhammer 3rd edition. But I'd never actually played with my own goblin warlord before when 4th edition came out. And he was my first. So uh, you always remember your first. You always remember your first. <laughs> Warg! Oh, 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 yes. Be, be, be gentle, Grom. Um, so, uh, that's an odd way to start any stream. <laughs> so, we're going to wait a couple of moments as you all gather out there, and I reminisce about those lovely times when Grom... Oh, we, point... can, we can do a quick thing of, how was your week? How have you been? What's up? What's going um, on? My week has been insanely busy. I'm heading down to Nottingham next week, where I'm going to be meeting with various gamey peeps and friends from the past and discussing war games and organizing some publishing deals for my company too, hopefully, um, on the role play side of things. I'm also going to be meeting up with Gav Thorpe, who you've met previously. Um, it's always nice to catch up. And Andy Chambers as well, who you may or may not know if you know your older Warhammer lore. So I'll be meeting up with him. Uh, I do know of Andy Chambers would be the best way to probably put it. <laughs> yeah, indeed um that's i hope tomorrow assuming that we're all healthy i'm getting up at 5 a.m in the morning to take a train down to nottingham i am going to be absolutely knackered i may also drop by warhammer world because how could you not quick there from biofoot hey youtube chat love what you've done with your hair very fetching nice one bio chat bio oh. chat biofoot bio <laughs> bio <laughs> <laughs> how was your week uh, my week's been very, very good. I'm still riding the high of all the new reveals uh, from Friday. That Ushorin, oh man, he's everything I wanted. He's ev- he's so big. He's as big as a demon. A mark. Like he's huge, which he should be. A lot of people. That's like one of the biggest uh, criminalities I think of Stragoy a lot of the time is a lot of people don't realize how fucking huge they get because Ushorin's yeah. blood. His like not muta- uh, mutation is not the right word, but like it's. One of the ways it expresses itself is grotesque size. Hey, Matthew. Uh, First Matthew, time catching us live. Oh, lovely. Who would win an eating contest? Oh, it's a good start. Grom, Throt, or Greasus? Uh, so Grom the Potch, Throt the Unclean, or Greasus Gold Tooth. As as fun as it is, I as as awesomely fun as the concept is. Unfortunately, Greasus is just a full size and a half bigger than all of them. The answer is Greasus. Yeah, Greasus <laughs> wins by... Greasus could not only out-eat the two easy. of them, but then turn around and eat both of them in the same meal. Yeah. Like, Gre- um, Greasus, Greasus is... Like, he... To, to put it in perspective, Greasus literally went to a tribe and won a series of challenges, and he had to eat all of his competitors, and he did. So he ate multiple ogre, a tyrant, and a bunch of bruisers in one sitting. <laughs> Like the answer is Greece. He's huge. All right, we've had a couple of minutes, so let's dive in at the beginning. I have a short intro this week. Um, unlike my no long meandering chats about what. You say that, but let's let's see where we end up. Let's see where we <laughs> end up. So, um, good old Grom the Paunch. The first time Grom the Paunch was added to the game was for Warhammer Fantasy Battle Fourth Edition, and he came in glorious two D inside the Warhammer Battle Box for 4th edition. It was the first time they moved from uh, releasing books uh, that, or perhaps box sets with rules in it to a full set with all of the miniatures that you needed to play. They realized that it was perhaps a little bit too expensive for them at that point in manufacturing to include a big goblin on a chariot or alternatively bolt throwers or Elfarian the Grim on a Stormwing Griffin. So what did they do? Cardboard. Cardboard <laughs> sandies. Cardboard. That's what they did. Cardboard. Now, back in those days, that meant if you went to get yourself an introductory game of Warhammer to learn how the game Warhammer worked at your local games workshop store, you would wander in and they'd have cardboard miniatures on the table. That how is, times have changed. That is crazy to think about. Like It is. And like, of course, nowadays, Games Workshop, I could just see them being like cardboard minis and they're $30 a pop. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, it was an interesting time because on tournament play, you had people saying, well, it's released by Games Workshop, so surely I can use cardboard miniatures. Um, and there were certain people who were like, no, no, that's heresy. How, how, no. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, regardless, Grom the Paunch, when he was first given to us, was given to us near the point where he was at the end of his life. Or at least the end of his endeavors, as we will cover when we go full circle right to the end. The end of his life isn't quite as endsome as you might first expect. And when we're first introduced to Grom the Paunch, he's not this great goblin warlord doing the classic goblin warlord thing, which is driving out from the mountains in a great wah to destroy everything in his path. Quite the opposite. He's at the head of a shattered yet still enormous horde that is invading, of all places, Althuin. And the battles that they present using the battle set is the goblins versus the high elves in Althuin. And as the setting expands later, the likelihood of this ever occurring becomes less and less and less as the goblins are explained in more depth and the high elves are explained in more depth. So each time they describe Grom, they have to up him a bit. And they have to up him a bit again when they realize that invading Ulthuin is next to impossible. So they really need to up Grom's game. And as each edition goes by, even though they use exactly the same background and barely change any detail, they do add one thing. And that's that there is a freaking shed load of them. It starts with the biggest goblin wah ever, which does include green skins of all types, of course. Mm. Um, and then turn it into, actually, it's the biggest, 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 biggest one ever. As we are going to cover, not only is Grom the Paunch the biggest goblin that has ever goblined, he has also gathered, arguably, one of the biggest green skin hordes that have ever threatened, not just the old world, but beyond. Not the biggest, we could argue some other various wahs of the past, but when we think of our various orc warlords from the past, Grom almost certainly outsizes all of them. This is a warlord that is quite simply extraordinarily effective, but he has himself a couple of issues, which means that his wa slows down at least twice. So we are uh, off to say, ooh, Grom the Paunch, and we will probably begin as we peel back from his end when he's facing off against the High Elves and go right back to the beginning when he's over in the Darkland Stroke Wolflands, a young goblin, a skinny goblin, a goblin like all the rest of his peers, and a goblin who is yet to become Grom the Paunch of the Misty Mountain, a goblin who is about to have himself a wager. Yeah, so a really, uh, I was actually talking... Gary to uh thank you gary uh, i was actually talking to andy about this before the stream that there's actually we can start very briefly but there's a funny problem with grom uh, there is right at the start which is that as you all kind of heard in uh andy's intro there he's known as grom the paunch of misty mountain the the misty mountain is like you know it's implied by the name that he's from there or has done something very significant there but if you look at the maps uh, that <laughs> they've actually printed that have the Misty Mountain notated on it, Grom has never been anywhere near Misty Mountain. <laughs> like in any story or anything that's ever been printed, there's no record of him going to Misty Mountain because it's hundreds of miles south of where Grom is supposedly from. Uh, because the first time we ever see Grom, he is already a boss of the Broken Axe tribe, which is not that powerful of a tribe, but they hang out around Thunder Mountain, which is like, not really that far south um in the grand scheme it's of not things far south at all i mean it's um it's sitting between it's sitting right by mad dog pass and down by death pass which if you know your warhammer bit is you've got the empire and the old world at the top and there's a big spine of world's edge mountains that continues down to the south I'll get you in this second gary um and near the top of that you get mag dog pass and you get peak pass and then it goes way further down and then you're reaching nagash azar where nagash plots and schemes and Nagash plot and scheming is we're really reaching the borderlands of the lands of the dead as we then go a little bit further down Misty Mountains all the way down there um, mm -hmm. so the, the best way of uh, covering up this hole is either to A, accept that Misty Mountain got named after Grom which is the case because that map came long after Grom the Paunch had been created for Warhammer 4th edition and someone just done screwed up or alternatively 
there's another Misty Mountain, probably up close to I, I, where the good old Broken Axe tribe are. I do have a theory, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Gary, thank you very much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Any odds of getting an Altharian video? Almost assuredly at some point. Uh, we yeah. definitely would like to talk about Altharian. He's a he is one of the best characters to examine as far as like how lore changes. Um, like man, he's he's a bizarre character if you actually sit down and look like awesome character, but he yeah. changes dramatically from edition to edition. Um, like almost not even the same character um in some extent. Also, hello to your girlfriend Joanna. Absolutely. Hi, Joanna. And, Hi, Joanna. Uh, Absolutely delighted to meet you. And good to meet you too as well, Gary. Um, let me just add as well on Eltharian, who is going to become obviously a, a key character as we move towards the end of Grom's story. Um, he's also an example of showing how strong the lore for Warhammer was all the way back in fourth edition, because that it grounded so many things that we now think are key to Warhammer. And Warhammer went through a couple of changes, Eltharian being a prime example, as already discussed there, of how those changes go. But when it came to the 8th edition and indeed Total War, they went right back to his first iteration and pretty much did the model, the old lead model that was made mm -hmm. for a 4th edition Warhammer a bajillion years ago. And, and for old people like myself, seeing Elfari and the Grim Warder of Tori of Rest come swooping out of the sky in Total War is fucking cool! Because like, hey, it's me old Eltharian chum that I used to play <laughs> with. I've painted that model like five times. This is brilliant! So, yes. Yeah, I actually have the Altharian the Blind model around here somewhere, um, which, great many, but uh, it's funny that it's just, like, technically not a canon interpretation of the character anymore. Yeah, totally. Uh, would Grom get the attention of the Great Maw? Probably, yes. Uh, I don't... It, whether he would have been able to hear it is a matter of... I think if Grom got close to the Great Maw, he would absolutely start hearing it, whispering in his head, and uh, exalting him to do things in the Mountains of Morn. Totally. It's almost um, it's almost a shame they never met. <laughs> uh, yeah. As as we get past our um initial discussions concerning uh well how Grom becomes Grom the Paunch, um, I'm going to stake an argument that one of his defining features is actually one of his least interesting qualities. Um, in that the Maw, for all that it is what it already is, go check our video if you haven't already done so. Um, I don't think it would particularly care because Grom doesn't particularly care um, uh, on the whole consumption yeah, front. That's fair. Um, Grom, Grom, go ahead, he's go just ahead. he's fat for a reason, and it's not because he wants to eat everything in his path. That would be nothing more than a piece of rhetoric, so to speak, or an easy way to say, "Hey, he's a fat lad. Surely he must eat too much." There's a deeper story here. Yeah, there's actually a really interesting argument. And we'll kind of talk about the way like Total War portrayed him and stuff. There actually could be a very convincing argument that Grump doesn't actually eat that much um, later in his life. Uh, and we'll yep, get into kind of like why. But uh, in Total War, they very much went with the, the idea that he eats a lot to maintain his size. Um, but whether or not that would be true is debatable. Um Yes, happy Thanksgiving to fellow Americans this week. Yes, hope you all enjoy uh, celebrating the Great Maw on Thursday by gorging yourself as much as possible. Make sure to throw a portion in the Maw pit you dig outside. <laughs> and uh, uh, and may Andy eat well too. Yes, Andy, <laughs> I hope you eat well I on Thursday for some reason. <laughs> always eat well. Um, but you colonists, go enjoy yourself. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> uh, thank we're going to turn to the good old yes. so, uh, wagering story. The story actually begins in uh, down in Thunder Mountain, or not Thunder Mountain, but just a little way south of Thunder Mountain, uh, where the Broken Extra and make Twitch chat starve. Rude. Um, <laughs> so before it. there is this tribe of goblins. Uh, they're just regular goblins. They're not night goblins or anything like that. They're kind of your classic gobbos. Mm -hmm. And they are the Broken Axe tribe, and things are not going super well for them. Uh, they're not a particularly influential tribe. They exist, and that's kind of about it. They're not particularly grandiose. They're not doing anything particularly exciting. They're not hanging out with, like, those weird Night Goblin lads down in Carrick Eight Peaks. They're not doing anything. And this is roughly, like, a hundred, a little over 100 years ago. Um, yeah, this is, um, if you want exact dates, we're at the moment at the 2390s Imperial Calendar late. Yeah, so... Grom is a boss in this tribe and goblins as they are wont to do when they're bored they usually end up doing some really stupid shit 
um, because they're bored. And there's honestly few things more dangerous than a bored green skin because they will find ways to entertain themselves that usually involve violence or people dying. And so Grom and some of his lads get together and we don't know who is responsible for this, but someone gets the idiot idea that they should all eat a piece of troll meat and whoever is the baddest will somehow survive this. Uh, though it's it likely is implied that it was probably less of a bar uh, a wager to eat troll meat specifically, and it was likely an eating contest to yeah, see like was. who could handle the grossest thing or the most difficult to eat thing. And as this was building up and building up, someone finally turned to look at Grom and was like, "I double dog dare you to eat a piece of troll meat," and Grom did because he's a moron. Uh okay, so. <laughs> So you get an idea here. For the vast majority of the species in the Warhammer world, eating troll meat is a sentence to death. Um, troll meat regenerates, grows and regenerates, and it's just simply bad stuff. Ogres don't have much of an issue with that, but that's because ogres are special. Others, though, when they get themselves into a big daring competition, if they want to eat troll meat, they cook it, they cook it, and they cook it again. It is, it is quite edible, I suppose, if you wish to use the word for the truest sense, in that it can be eaten, but it needs to be massively cooked. Grom, in his, let's say, cleverness, chose to eat it raw. Yep, and CEO of Necromancy, thank you for that. And uh, yes, you're you're correct. It is, yeah. Carrot Gate Peaks Week will never end. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, Grom eats this. And to, be, to be completely clear, eating troll meat, it's not just that you're going to die. You're going to die horribly. Oh, yeah. And relatively slowly. Um, but uh, holy shit, Turnip Bandit. Thank you very much. Sweet Jesus. Uh, that'll pop up in a second. So, oh my God, dear God, that is super generous. Thank you hey, very much. Turn it, Bannon. Thank you very much. My Lord, uh, dude. Uh, I, I think you should take time in reading this one. Yeah, hold <laughs> on. I got to Yeah. Uh, hey, guys, if Grom hadn't gone to Ulthuan and instead went elsewhere, do you think he'd be as successful as Grimgore? How dangerous would that be for the world? Love you guys, stream. Also, I'm one episode away from being caught up on Lawbeards. Uh, I assume uh, you mean Lawhammer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, no, it's Lawbeards now. It's an associated brand. <laughs> Gerhard really needs to give better hugs to his group. Hugs for you, May. <laughs> oh, bless. <laughs> yeah, I know. I like how you shouldn't have given him his short-term goal of hugging of hugging Lucas because clearly his hug wasn't good enough. It was <laughs> he didn't deserve that in bonus XP. <laughs> um, so I'll um, answer this one super quickly. Um, the answer is probably yes. Yeah, I would say if anything, Grom was. Honestly, a more successful war boss than Grimgore is. Yeah. Um, Grimgore, Grimgore is not a good war boss. Like Grimgore himself is a force of nature, but as far as war bosses go, he's really not that impressive. Mm -hmm. Um, because he doesn't really lead his uh guys that much, and he kind of just likes to fight monsters and hordes. But like Grom was bizarrely uh a half decent leader, but we'll get into some yeah. things about it. But um, in fact, I'm gonna argue that Grom is possibly one of the finest goblin tacticians that has ever existed. And this is an argument, it's not stated black and white in the text, but when one looks at his achievements and looks at his failures, his failures are those of character or alternatively circumstance, as we'll get to. But when it comes to his military successes, they are almost second. To none, but we'll get to that. So, yeah. um, my answer to that the, to the enormous question would be damn straight. And thank you very much again, Turner. Yeah, the world wherever Grom went, he won with very few yeah. exceptions. So, if he had gone east, because a lot of what screwed him in Ulthuan was because he went to Ulthuan in the first place. If he had gone yeah. somewhere else, he would have kind of been unstoppable for as long as he wanted to. And uh, Gary, to, thank you for the sweet message. Super, that was super nice. I, I'm also going to make an argument when we reach that point about why Grom is where he is and what it potentially would have meant for the end times if everyone had connected all the dots. But yeah. we ain't there yet. And um, yes, <laughs> turn it around. <bandit>, we realized. <laughs> all right. Um, so and might I just say thank you very much for watching us over on the Lawhammer side of things. If you don't know, we, because um, apparently this came out last week, a lot of you out there don't realize that we alternate. Uh, our source of streaming every week and that one week we're over here on mm -hmm. lore master Slotex channels and on the next week we're over on the lawhammer channels doing the lore beer chats so if you didn't already realize make sure you go over to lawhammer and subscribe there because that's where we do half of our lore beer chat 
Yes, and also just watch the Lawhammer series. Oh, wow. amazing. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> so the thing about troll meat, uh, and why, and the reason why eating it will kill you is that troll regeneration is freakish. It is horribly freakish in that most forms of regeneration in the Warhammer fantasy world end when the creature dies. Like, if you blow its brain out, it's going to stop regenerating. That is not necessarily the case for trolls. Uh, their regeneration is almost more at, like, a, a fundamental level of their entire DNA. So if you have a piece of troll, like an arm or a slab of meat you cut off from a stomach or whatever hypothetically it can grow back into an entire troll yeah hypothetically let me add to that as well um one of the reasons in the warhammer world that most stuff works is because of the winds of magic go check our winds of magic stream for more on that one in particular mm. here we're talking gyron the wind of life and trolls clearly attract a lot of it and if you put troll meat in a great welling of gyron as in a, inside another living creature it's far more likely to keep on doing what it does than if it's outside just drying in the sun so Taking in troll meat just is not a good thing to do. And all the goblins know this, but let's be honest, goblins aren't always the brightest or perhaps the ones with the most foresight. And good old Grom, he gobbles it all down. Yeah, so Grom goes through uh, a pretty horrific process where basically this piece of meat in his belly starts expanding. Now, he's not completely out of hope because his digestive system is working to break down the troll meat to essentially kill it before it can mm -hmm. regenerate enough but he doesn't do super well in the first few days of this weeks contest. weeks weeks oh, yeah, weeks. yeah. Um, um there, there's loads of different versions of this story and it's fascinating to see how each writer's tackled it but in the end it's kind of landed on weeks and it's not just weeks of oh oh my belly's a bit upset the dude's in trouble he's in agony he's not just expelling an enormous quantity of horrific yuck it's <laughs> continually going the flatulence <laughs> is quite incredible goblins are gathered around him giggling away going ha, 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 what's happening to grom but his digestion is sort of keeping up with the troll meat that he has ingested and he has well after a few weeks he's, he's not dead yet yeah, uh, does Grom put pineapple on his troll meat pizza? He, uh, I'm sure he would. Grom seems enough of an abomination, I wouldn't put it past him. I think so. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Vinius. <laughs> so, the yeah, so the thing is, is that Grom, so while he's rapidly digesting this, his body seems to slowly but surely, agonizingly slowly, start taking up properties from the troll meat that it is digesting. And that mm -hmm. two big things start to happen to Grom, which is the first is that he starts to get bigger. He starts to get a lot fatter and fatter and fatter, and his stomach just keeps expanding outwards. But yep. the second thing is that just his body starts to take on its own form of regeneration to keep up with what's happening to him. Because if he wasn't able to regenerate, he literally would have just popped. Uh, he would have just burst and died. Yep. But it seems that Grom kind of accidentally hit on eating just the right amount of troll meat that it gave him, his body was able to digest long enough that it started to kind of break down and take on some of the properties of the very troll he had consumed through mm. sheer accident because yeah. Grom is lucky. <laughs> so what does this all mean? It means that approximately five to ten years later, as we're turning into the 2400s with the Imperial calendar, Grom is no longer just a goblin boss of his tribe. Grom is now large and in charge. He has taken control of his tribe, and not only has he done so, he has reached the point where he is, well, let's take a small, slight diversion into green skin psychology. It's a really simple one. But the bigger you are with green skins, the more impressive you are. The mm. bigger you are, the scarier you are. The bigger you are, the more the other goblins or orcs or whatever will fall behind you. There is a certain pecking order with orcs because particularly with green skins, the more that they get hit, the more that they go to war, the bigger they get anyway. So it shows that brutally speaking, they have been through more fights than any of their peers. They are simply bigger and better. Grom took a shortcut, but that shortcut 
also meant that he was bigger and stronger and could regenerate, which is kind of handy, meaning that he reached the point where he not only took over his own tribe, he started looking outwards, as all greenskins are wont to do. Now, it's worth noting with goblins that typically you don't get giant waz that go hand in hand with goblins, because goblins by their nature are cowardly, more intelligent, arguably, than their bigger orc cousins. And I do say arguably because some orcs are much more intelligent than many hmm. people give them credit for. It's just they have a different type of intelligence. They can make some exceedingly capable tacticians on the battlefield. It's just that they value different things than, say, the other species of the Warhammer world. So they view them as uncivilized or as stupid, where they just aren't. But Grom, he got big. He went to battle. And he started to win, and the biggest one was taking over one of the local orc tribes. A uh, particularly unprecedented uh, attack on another one, whose name was, was it Zok Gutstabba? Yeah, Zok of Zork? the Gutstabbers, yes. yes. I remembered it. Good I old mean, gut good job. I was just checking that, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is this is, a, this is an important moment for Grom mm. in that, so... Like Andy said, there are Grom actually has a surprisingly long history. Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. people think it's like they just look at the timeline, they see like the four years that are accredited to him, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg of his final rampage. Yep. But Grom spends like decades down in the southern badlands and the southern world's edge mountains being a menace. But uh, the first part of his story is after he gets big enough to take over the full entirety of the Broken Axe tribe, he starts moving out. And the big thing, like Andy said, is that the Gut Stabas get involved, which the Gut Stabba tribe were a tribe of orcs that lived over on Thunder Mountain, and they had showed up fairly recently and taken over the Night Goblins of Thunder Mountain. Yeah, so that's a big thing, because that's a double takeover if uh, Grom is successful. Yeah, so there is, like, a lot of big stuff going on, and this new orc war boss has shown up, and he's a mover. Like, he's trying to make things happen. And mm -hmm. the goblins of the Broken Axe tribe go, oh, God, there's a orc, you know, we need to, we need to throw ourselves behind him or he's going to come squash us. And Grom goes, nah, nah, I'm going to deal with this. And he literally hefts his axe over his shoulder and he starts walking over. And uh, to his credit, Zonk being an orc, hears about this fat goblin coming and tells everyone, leave him alone. Don't mess with him. I'll, I'll deal with it when he gets here. But I don't want anybody to mess with him because I want to put him in his place. And this is classic uh, green skin psychology, because if you t kill the leader of this tribe, you will become the new leader of this tribe. So he's very much wanting to be the one to take it over. If one of his lesser bosses does it, that lesser boss effectively takes over that tribe. And then he's possibly going to have a power struggle with that boss. So mm. instead of doing this, he's gone, no, all of you stop. He's mine, mine. And if anyone crosses me, well, you know what's going to happen. And in comes Grom. Yes, <laughs> Grom waddles in and uh, th they fight pretty, like they throw down immediately. And what happens is that Zonk does what his tribe apparently is probably very good at and where their name comes from. He stabs Grom in the gut and he, he, he stabs him and he rips it out and it should have been an easy mortal blow. But everyone watches in shock as Grom instantly regenerates. And yeah, and then just <laughs> didn't just bisex this poor orc because <laughs> Grom Grom lives by the classic adage, which is that he's not technically freakishly strong for his size, but he's huge because he's so fat. Like he's not even that tall in the grand scheme of things, but he's so wide that the amount of strength that takes him to move around means that if he hits you, it's with a shocking amount of force. And what we get here is um, a lovely difference between the Grom of the beginning of his story and let's answer the Laughing God first. That's where he remembers. I want a Grom novel titled Gut to Gut, A Gobble's Rise to Glory. <laughs> <laughs> That's laughing it's, God. Inspiration. it's an inspirational self-help novel for all goblins. <laughs> So in comparison to where he will become, where Grom becomes effectively the biggest, baddest goblin that there ever was. At the moment, Grom is more just a big goblin. He's not the baddest. That will come after conflict, after conflict, after conflict, as he gets bigger, not just because of the troll meat that's slowly swelling inside him, but he's also gaining victories. But beyond that, at this point... To make to ensure that these orcs do indeed listen to him, he kills every single last one of the bosses that are there. He doesn't just kill Zok, he kills them all, all the biggest orcs, to ensure that the remainder of the tribe and the night goblins they've conquered follow him. 
He hacks every last one down, and it completely exhausts him. By the end of it, he is wiped out. He can barely move, and he has fallen backwards, spread out all over the place, sitting in the midst of this complete bloodshed when he hears a tiny little squeak <laughs> as he eventually moves. Um, and eventually, somehow, yeah. eventually, and somehow, <laughs> when he eventually gets up, this little squeaky eh, 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 comes out, and a tiny little goblin who has survived being underneath Grom and his paunch for the last however long he was last resting, glowering at anyone that comes too close to him with his big axe, um, comes out. And uh, Grom looks at this one and goes, Hey, well, you know, you're obviously a very lucky goblin, aren't you, to be still alive? Yeah. And he's like, eh. And he's like, well, you can now be my standard bear since you're so lucky. Now, he was a night goblin, which is why there's a night goblin following Grom around all over the place. Good old name Good old of Niblet. Niblet. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and Niblet uh, goes along with Grom pretty much from that day forward and does not fall. Lucky little bastard that he is. Yeah, so he will Niblet... be his good luck standard onwards. Niblet is a very interesting little character in that, A, he is genuinely freakishly lucky. Uh, he he does have the blessing of Mork. It is undeniable he has the blessing of Mork. Uh, and he's very small for a night goblin. Like, he's actually a little teeny tiny guy. Uh, but there is a hilarious quote I will never forget from one writer in particular. I want to say it was like in the 7th edition Greenskin's book, where it basically says that uh, Niblet... Oh, Sean. When is a turkey oh, scary when it's a goblin? Uh, thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Um, the hey, idea, uh, there's a note by one of the authors who's tackled this story that Niblet saw things when he was trapped beneath Grom. Like he experienced a, a mind bending, world altering experience that resulted in that when he re um. reemerged into life, <laughs> he was incredibly giddy and dedicated himself in his entire life to being Grom's hype man. And all he does is not only just hang out with Grom because he's very lucky, but he literally just shouts and hoots and hollers about how great Grom is. And he's this little jester type character who, if you're ever dealing with Grom, you're probably going to have to deal with Niblet interrupting you constantly talking about how cool Grom is and how awesome he is and how fat he is and how big he is. And I, everyone but Grom probably hates him. <laughs> There. And also to add to the ridiculous comedy of this character, remember that Grom never ever digests this troll meat and is known for his explosive flatulence. It's constantly going; it never stops. Wherever he's going, there's like, <laughs> um, he, he is a walking fart machine. Um, and sometimes it is very explosive, and that's what Niblet lived under for a good few hours. Yay! Yeah, that, that he 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 saw he saw more in more ways than one <laughs> yeah but, quite uh, and but, it's worth saying though that um you could argue this is the point when mork and gork get directly involved if you're the sort that think that gods get directly involved because mm -hmm. we have here almost a lovely manifestation for both mork and gork or both gork and mork depending upon how you look at it um to now start what will become pretty much one of the biggest was that the old world will ever see yeah, so this is the big turning point for Grom because not only did he just whoop a whole bunch of orc war uh, big bosses, but this demonstrates that he can conquer orcs. Uh, and this is what finally sets off. And granted, having Niblet constantly hyping him up may also have played a key role in this, but this is what finally sets Grom on the warpath in the southern Badlands and the World's Edge Mountains, where he yeah. starts going around, going up to every tribe he can find and going, Oi, you're my gits now. And they start fighting. And he, he he obliterates anybody that tries to mess with him to the point that even black orcs and orc war bosses start to go, I don't want to really fight that Grom guy. Like, we'll join up with his army because he goes where the he knows where the good fights are. And if we follow yeah. him, we'll get some good looting. But I don't want to I don't want to mess with him. Yeah, this turns into a proper wah. This is when he moves from just being a goblin warlord of his local tribe into building a wah, a proper orc. For those of you who haven't seen a wa or read about the wa's of the greenskins, it's when a great tide of greenskins all go in one direction, generally behind one key figure. And it is a little bit like the tides. They ebb and there's a period of calm between, and then all the greenskins fall behind a warlord 
and they come back in and sometimes they rush right across the shore and deep in land. A tide is a relatively good metaphor here. And sometimes there's very, very high tides. And in this case, Grom is about to start one of the highest green skin tides ever. The general way that most of the other species of the old world deal with this, and they are quite aware of what green skins do. It happens again and again. It's a little bit like the waxing and waning of the chaos gates. <clears throat> the way they deal with it is they take out the warlords. They mm. realize it's coming. Assassins are sent in to try and deal with it. And it's really hard because if someone's reached the point where they're behind the wah, they themselves are almost impossibly powerful already, which means a simple shot is not going to kill them. Orcs, for all we don't generally think of greenskins as regenerating creatures, they kind of do. You cut off an orc arm and you pop it back in its socket. It's probably going to start working again. They're not like humans. They're not like elves. They're not like dwarves. They're very, very sturdy. And goblins have the same underlying physiology. It's just they're so much smaller. And even the biggest goblin looks small to most orcs. So it's very unlikely that they reach the point where they can lead an enormous wah, be big enough to get orcs to fall in line. Grom was the exception. Yeah, so by this point, Grom is getting big enough that he's bigger than most orcs. Uh, not necessarily taller than them, but he's certainly wider than them. <laughs> and <laughs> he never really gets bigger than the orcs, yeah. does he? No. He's always uh, a goblin. <laughs> but uh, Grom is very, very successful in this campaign that more or less spans a decade-ish, uh, where he takes over the vast majority of the Badlands and the vast majority of the World's Edge Mountains, which is terrifying. Uh, let's let's clarify that at this point he hasn't taken the world's edge mountains um oh, because the, yeah that's better because just to make sure we get clear the world's edge mountains the spine of the world are fucking huge um, yeah. and they go right from almost the, the the southlands deep into them all the way up to the realms of chaos themselves pretty much um so uh he's taken an enormous chunk of the southern section and uh is as we move to the point of it becoming a true wah and it's about to head outwards, we're now talking the year 2410, as I recall. So 2410, he sets his sights into the border princes and beyond. And in 2410, he sweeps pretty much the entirety of the border princes. But here's one thing that Grom does that most other war orc warlords don't, because Grom is a goblin. And he does things differently to orcs. Orcs go to wherever the biggest, baddest place is, and they pretty much take camp and take it down. They're looking for the biggest thing to destroy, which generally means the human cities or an equivalent. And to begin with, that's very not, very much not Grom's plan. Grom fights everything in his path. And if you hide in cities, he tends to sweep past you, which is hmm. so unlike other Waz, which also ensures his Wa doesn't just last a year or two. We're already reaching the point where he's been kicking around for a good couple of decades or so. And as we're going to cover, we're at 2410. Throughout the course of the next 10 years, he will have success after success after success. And one of the primary reasons for this is because of his goblin mentality. When he, but when he conquers, he doesn't really care about the big cities, meaning that almost all of them stand after Grom passes. Not all, a bunch of them fall, but he really only takes one imperial city properly, just one. But it's fair to say he completely conquers the empire as we're moving forward in the future. And this is just a hundred years ago. Yeah. But 2410, he's moving through the border princes up towards Blackfire Pass. Yeah. And th th I will say if there's ever a writer out there who happens to listen to this and happens to work for GW and happens to touch on Grom, if you were going to include something about the Misty Mountain, this would be the time to do it. Is that maybe like the ultimate triumph victory he has in the Badlands and Southern World's Edge Mountains is he goes all the way mm -hmm. south to the Misty Mountain, which is like right next to the Sour Sea. It's very far south. And maybe he wins some great victory there and goes, all right, I want to go north now. And he turns around and heads back north. You know, in fact, I'm going to re-support re that. Um, if I were to sit down and try to make the story, this is where you'd make it. And you'd make him have an enormous success against something that all the Greenskins themselves had fled from. And the answer to that is Nagash. So what he's almost certainly done is he's gone south and he has faced off against the outer forces of uh, the undead and conquered them and gone, I'm not scared, and fucks off over the World's Edge Mountains and starts conquering over there. Basically, he does what all the other Greenskins don't, in that he is almost fearless. He feels like he can face anything. 
but he's also a goblin, so he's careful and he'll use propaganda, good old Niblet, to his side. So I think this mm. is a really good point. He takes something that no other orc warlord has, and that gives you a really good reason to have the name Misty Mountain. I agree. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. A, a big vac a big victory against the Deadens. Uh, yeah. Would be very, very iconic for him, and it would match his character a lot, especially because there's there would be kind of the hilarious idea of Grom winning. But kind of realizing that killing the dead ends really isn't that fun because there's not a lot of loot and great times to be had, and just going, ah, you know, screw this, let's go fight the dwarfs. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, laughing god. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of like, um, on that, if you want to give it a little bit of extra depth, you could very easily have what was once one of the primary orc holds down in the south being in the Misty Mountains. So one of their primary areas, it was taken over by the encroaching expansion of the undead and had been lost for at least living memory for the Greenskins. And there'd be multiple attempts. They had failed. They were terrified of it. And Grom was the one that took it back consolidated it and then just moved right on yeah, out really um, well. yeah that that's a lovely story that is just waiting to be told um yeah. and it allows the map as it currently stands not to contradict with his background yeah so anyway uh he heads north and like he said he sweeps into the border princes and the thing about grom to put in perspective how big his wa is if you look at the map of the old world and realize how big the border prince is grom's wa is so fucking huge that he is attacking pretty much the entirety of the Borner Princes simultaneously. Because yes. his wall follows behind him and it moves slow. Grom doesn't move particularly fast for Waz. Because like Andy said, orcs often rampage with a particular target in mind. There's a shiny Umi city or a spiky Umi chaos lord or a dwarf. Something they want to lay siege to and beat up. Which usually causes their momentum to slow down. Grom doesn't slow down. He just keeps going. You could almost imagine um, his wa moving like there's him on his chariot because he's a wolf rider at heart. He's from the wolf lands. He himself is far too big to sit in a wolf anymore because, well, he's grown the paunch and he's got a big paunch that's bigger than most wolves. So he sits in the back of a chariot with all of his wolf riders running with him. And he does the wolf rider mentality in that he is naturally a guerrilla warfare expert. He is not a siege warfare expert. So he just glides forward. And if you're looking to try and characterize his wine in comparison to others, I think it would be fair to say that there was a lot of independence amongst the various war bosses that were underneath them. Probably one of the ways he managed to keep those war bosses underneath them. And they were all moving off in different prongs across the border princes. So while Grom himself isn't going that fast, it's a steady march northwards, everything is getting destroyed all around him. And he makes what, in comparison to most orc warlords, is formidable time because normally orcs stop at the big place and they crush it they take down and then they have big celebrations and they're raising up dung heaps and they're taking whatever statues may have been in that city and hacking them into orc shapes that's not what happens here he goes through and there's defeat after defeat after defeat of the border princes and they all flee off towards their various castles and many of them pass on some orcs stay behind and do the classic orc thing and normally that would have been the center of the wa as they all moved around that individual siege but grom just kept on going forward and moves into blackfire pass and then from blackfire pass into the world's edge mountains mm. as the as the wa behind him keeps on fighting against all of these pockets of resistance in various cities some of which will never fall some of which most certainly do and orcs from all around just keep on gathering because unlike most was his one kind of doesn't stop there's never really a point when anyone can say hey grom has suffered defeat as he moves forward and forward there becomes a point, though, when it's quite clear that this wa has to be stopped. So the dwarves, they send a mighty host out to try and deal with them. They send them underneath a little known king. Um, his name is? Uh, Bragaric. Mm. Bragaric, excellent. Bragaric. Now, King Bragaric is a king that is not one of the primary kings of the holds as we all know them. Um, king Bragaric is probably very strongly implied to be the king of Karak Varn. Now, Karak Varn is a fallen hold. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a king. They have a king in isolation, perhaps living yeah, in the it's empire like how somewhere. King Belagar's, or uh, Belagar's father was a king, even yeah, though he exactly. wasn't in Karak Eight Peaks. Okay, so he's the king of Karak, probably the king of Karak Varn. I'm going to add probably. All the indications suggest he was. Um, and he was the king, and they have a massive, massive army that gathers up by Karak Varn. Yeah, well, over I, for I, the... so it is worth noting, very briefly, that Grom does spend a couple of years being a menace to the dwarves. 
Um, like oh uh, well, yes, yeah, so, well, he's moving through no, that. Yeah, yeah, no, no major holds are destroyed during this time, but it says some um, minor ones are destroyed, even though it doesn't give any names. Uh, it some does, mines it, are wiped out. All, all around the uh, world's edge, all around Blackfire Pass, all of the mines through there get destroyed as he makes his march north, yeah. and he's going to march through the entirety of the world's edge mountains if he's not stopped yeah and there's so they... one hilarious incident which is supposedly what finally kicks off the dwarfs to be like all right enough is enough where he finds the shrine or the statue of grugni which is a <laughs> giant statue carved out of a mountain and grom sees and sees it on his rampage he goes uh make that look like me <laughs> and so all these goblins swarm up on it and they remake these the iconic statue of grugni out of, out of a mountain itself into a statue of Gr a very crude statue of grom <laughs> jonathan ridiculous grom, um, the answer would uh, almost certainly be no because they would not be celebrating this horror that pretty much as you're about to find out destroys everything in its path it, and it's not like green skins have many anything, memories some, of this if there would be something like grom punch it would probably be a form of fungus brew or something would, that some goblin would, tribe has blood bowl that's where you'd get it yeah um, oh yeah blood bowl would absolutely have grom punch totally. <laughs> so we have um iron gate now iron gate was one of the primary defensive um outposts of what once was the great kingdom of Carrick varn um and the battle for iron gate is enormous it's pretty much the Dude. entire spearhead the spearhead of Grom's Wa, which is really a spearhead. It has deep depth, really deep depth. But if they can take out Grom, they are going to probably stop this entire Wa on this day. And dwarfs from across the holds come and join the force right beside Karak Varn, um, up by the Black Waters. Um, so we have dwarves from holds across the World's Edge Mountains, down to mm -hmm. the Black Mountains, and from elsewhere, and from across the Empire. They've all come marching bold and brave, desperate to stop what they perceive to be potentially something that could take down the entirety of the, well, all of Karak Ankor, all of the Dwarf Kingdoms. And we have a big fight. I bet you can't guess who's going to win. Yes, yeah, so uh, Kring Bagarit, supposedly, he, uh, well, not supposedly, the Dwarves do make a good showing for themselves. Um, the battle, uh, were the Wood Elves ever affected by Grom? Yeah, every. No. So not the no. Wood Elves of Athel Lauren. No, um, Athel Lauren. As as we classically know, the answer is no. And as we move up towards the, as we go up towards the Laurel Lorne, uh, we'll have a discussion as to exactly what happens. But by this point, Grom's Wa has got a very, very different tenor because it's influenced by an orc shaman. Um, where beforehand, it's very much his own want and his own whim. Yeah, we'll um, he eventually gets to good old old Blacktooth, a very old, very well known orc shaman who eventually falls into the retinue, and it ca happens at some point during the World's Edge Mountains. Hey, Hammond! What did Grom um, say when the read read the monkeys wouldn't move out of the way? There's a emergency. They don't want to move it, move it. Ugh. Oh, I was like, <laughs> That was yeah. a stretch. Yeah. I, I, I see what you're reaching for, but it was it's a reach. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, Karak so, Varn, um, yeah. we've got Iron Gate, battle, we've got Grom, we've got the King. Yeah, so we got the Battle of Iron Gate, huge fight, giant throng of dwarves. We're talking thousands of dwarves, war machines, gyrocopters, all your favorite stuff. Uh, and it's a huge battle. It lasts for mm -hmm. three days. Like, yep. not like going, stopping and starting. Three days of constant fighting of the dwarves up against the Iron Gate and the greenskins just coming in wave after wave after wave with Grom himself, who nobody could kill. They're shooting him. He regenerates. They chop him down. He just regenerates he's having the time of his life and he's very good at chopping up dwarves with that fucking giant axe of his you can thank mark gibbons for that one who was on one of our previous streams because mark did the first enormous axe i think for that one yeah Too the crazy. axe from is a big old axe um so what's, what's up? Oh. favorite rapper well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. so moving on um, yeah so anyway <laughs> so after three days of fighting um it's enough of a fight that even the green skins have to back up because like everybody's like okay we need a breath um and grom is known to fight until he gets exhausted and then he just kind of sits around lazing around for a while which he actually will do numerous more times that is a yes, style will. of grom uh, yeah. so grom decides to just lay down somewhere and the green skins back up and this gives the dwarves time to back up and kind of collect a lot of their dead and the dwarves realize they can't beat them 
They're yep. too grossly outnumbered. And no matter what they throw at them, Grom just won't die. So they decide to do the things the dwarves do always when things get really bad. They run back to their holds. But King Braggeret does do something in particular, which is that he sends a messenger. Yeah. Okay, now this is a big thing. This is a big thing at multiple uh, levels. First, the dwarves retreat, which means that they've got a fallen hold and they have decided they're going to leave that hold fallen. The king, I, am, I imagine at this point, is thinking, this is my opportunity. I will also take my hold. I have a reason to get dwarves from everywhere to come to my fallen hold. I'm going to get it back. We're going to, and he's abandoned. All the other dwarves from the other holds go, we can't win. This is just a loss of our lives and is a waste. No, your hold has fallen, my king. I'm sorry, we cannot help you anymore. We tried, and look, we're going to fail. And the dwarves, as much as I imagine, it fills them with deep dissatisfaction, decide to leave. The king is furious, beyond furious. He ends up going all the way up to Caragate Peaks in his fury. He sends a letter over to the emperor, and he uh, says... Oh, uh, I think you mean Karazakarak. I did mean Karazakarak. Get my uh, correct hold yeah, there. Yeah, you're Karazakarak. Um, and the High King gets involved and also reinforces the letter that they send down towards the Emperor, Emperor Dieter IV. Now, we're going to move into a completely different set of lore here, a lore where I'm very much in my comfort zone. Um, <laughs> this is lore of the Empire. Now, Dieter IV um, is arguably one of the Empire's most notorious emperors. He is the last emperor of one of the Sterling lines, of all things, before... A new imperial family takes over, as you're about to find out why. Um, now, this emperor was particularly, let's say, interested in making his imperial capital, which was in Nuln, even though he himself was a Sterling electric out. He'd taken the capital of Nuln, much like Magnus the Pious, the emperor, a couple of emperors back before him. And he was turning Nuln into something completely different. And when I say turning Nuln, he, was, he raised over half of it. He knocked down enormous sections. He, the only castle that he Get left the the out of here. Now, yeah, totally. The only castle he left up, um, up at the top was the original castle of Magnus the Pious because he didn't want to knock that down. But he built another palace beside it. He built golden, a massive, huge golden palace sitting out on the main th uh, hill at the side, surrounded that by temples to all of the gods. There was marble and gold everywhere. He was drawing taxes from across the empire to rebuild Nuln in his image. And when he received a letter from the dwarves saying, hey, we want you to send a really, 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 really big force over to the World's Edge Mountains outside of your borders to help support us before we fall, he went, yeah, nah. 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 Nah, I'm not doing that. And even when the High King himself gets behind this, so we're talking about that's Al that's Alrickson at the moment. So the High King well, Alric, I, I, no, it would actually be Thorgrim. Or cause, no, no, wait, is, is this it? is this post Magnus? Yeah, yeah this post. No, it's Thorgrim. It's Thorgrim himself. Yeah, it's Thorgrim. Yeah, it's Thorgrim. Of course, yeah. it's Thorgrim. Okay, it's Thorgrim. Of course, it's Thorgrim. So it's Thorgrim Grudgebear himself sends off a letter at the behest of the other king. And he's like, you're going to do it. Oh, I'll bloody send him a bloody letter. I'll send him He'll a bloody him letter. Him. He'll <laughs> honor Sigmar. Yeah, there, yeah. There's no way we won't be sent. Oh, there's so many green skins right now. I could see them with my own telescope. No. So he writes him a furious letter as well, covered with dwarven runes. And the emperor receives that and goes, who's this king? Because, you know, he's just a human. It's just, oh, there's the high king, is it? Uh, he's my equivalent, is he? We can't be doing this. I've got big, you know, things going on. Oh, there's green skins in the mountains. There's always green skins in the mountain. And he also replies, no, which immediately puts Dieter in the book of fucking grudges. Um, and literally, the um, this is a big thing. The emperor, the emperor himself <laughs> is put into the book of grudges in many respects. This is such a slight that the cult of Sigmar itself, which is very closely tied to the dwarves, immediately looks at their emperor and goes, oh, shit. Uh-oh. Yeah. We got a problem here. We have a problem. So Grom does not receive an answer from the empire, which, as we're about to find out in a couple of years' time, is going to be hell. 
for yeah, the Empire. Thorgrim. Yeah, so yeah. What, there's a couple of interesting things that happen here uh, from both the Dwarf side and the Empire side, which from the Dwarf side, the Empire not responding... The, the Empire not only saying like, oh, no, we're not going to be able to do this exact thing, but just saying no. Like, Dieter goes <laughs> so far in his obnoxiousness that it, he doesn't even say, you know what, we're going to gather our armies, but we're not going to march in the mountains, but we're going to meet them somewhere mm -hmm. else. He refuses to call yeah. upon his armies. He just want, he like, he literally lives. He seems to be possessed by an idea that if he doesn't acknowledge the problem, he doesn't have to deal with it. So he refuses to summon the armies. He doesn't tell the other electric counts what's happening. He doesn't warn anybody in the empire about Grom. He just looks at it and goes, I don't want to deal with this and just doesn't. Mm -hmm. So when the dwarves hear about this, uh, they're like, okay, he's not even summoning his armies and he's ignored our call for help. Well, fuck him. So Thorgrim yeah. turns to all the dwarf kings to go, okay, here's what's going to happen. In this book, as long as Deirdre the Fourth is alive and as long as he is emperor, we will not help the empire under any circumstances. No matter what happens, no matter who calls to you for aid and what your prior packs will be, I as High King am telling you, do not help the empire under any circumstances until this emperor is dead. And uh, that is going to cause some problems, some big ones. Yep. So and we the get the idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. They, they, the go dwarves back to their they close the doors and they lock them, which is critical because, like Andy said, Grom doesn't do sieges. Yeah. So and Grom realizes the doors are boring now. So we have five years. They're not quite boring because we have five years of him marching through the World's Edge Mountains. And his wa is, um, imagine it again like a spear tip. They're following in Grom's path and everything behind him is getting conquered properly as he himself keeps on moving forth. Now, he himself is a wolf rider. Um, so his passage through the World's Edge Mountains is very slow because he's moving through old passes and he's moving and conquering other greenskin tribes, going for anything that's poorly defended by the dwarves, causing them to flee back to their holds. Arguably, this is the worst period on the dwarf modern I mean, their history, mm -hmm. because pretty much every one of their major mines, every one of their major um, outposts is destroyed throughout the entirety of the World's Edge Mountains. All that's left is a few sporadic holds and what they can then rebuild after Grom passes. He wipes it all out. He gets all the way up to way deep into Kislev territory and every single tribe he passes says, yeah, no, you're a goblin. Actually, fuck, we're joining you. <laughs> he ends up with some of the biggest orc tribes and greenskin tribes, the red eye goblins, for example, truly enormous tribe, um, sitting up um, mm. by Kislev, one of the largest tribes of goblins that there is, completely fallen behind him. And eventually, they've got a choice as they head northward do we keep on going northwards and end up going towards those crazy, kooky, crappy, horrible, chaosy guys, or do we not? The answer, in many respects, comes not by Grom, arguably, but by the very nature of Greenskins, because they don't just follow behind, they start spreading out. So five years of northern expansion turns into approximately 24-15 time now, when orcs start raiding deep into Empire territory, goblin wolf riders coming out of the mountains, the mountains that from end to end are now goblin territory. It's not a matter of where he's basically got a kingdom that spans mm. from the spans from Kislev almost down to Nagashazar and all of the badlands down into the wolflands, and it's pretty much all his. Uh, but it is uh it's fair to say that this is not a kingdom in the traditional sense. He's not a king. Um, and he doesn't have any real rule. It's more anarchy everywhere. It's anarchy in the world's edge mountains. Hey, red eye tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Why the oh, dude. <laughs> Hammond? Ah. Good old Red Eye Mountain. Uh, what's so? What's <laughs> interesting about Grom is not only is he grabbing up all these orc tribes that he's beating to a pulp, but goblins start hearing about Grom uh, a little ways before this point. Where goblins are traveling <laughs> from all over the place to come see Da Biggin, as they know him. Yeah, because the, the idea of a goblin is leading this war. It's not. It's not like old. You know, it's in their heads. It's like oh, is a new wah is it like old uh uh oh my gosh um the other big orc war boss iron claw uh um, one gorbad iron claw yeah Gor they're like, oh is that like Gorbad. old gorbad they're like nah it's a goblin 
the, they have to see this. The goblins yeah. have to see this. So you have forest goblins are coming out of the forest to come join mm -hmm. Grom with all their arachnoroks and spider riders. You have mm -hmm. the wolflands to the east get almost emptied with all of the uh with Grom's expansion have created smaller tribes. Yes, yes we will we will talk Many. about Many. We'll be talking about that. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, the aftermath of Grom is almost more significant than Grom himself. I agree. Um, in many respects, Grom is responsible for the end times. Yeah, and like modern greenskins and like the fact that they are every fucking where is mostly because of Grom. Yeah. Um, so, but like we've got the wolf lands empty of all the wolf rider tribes who have like some of them have like almost like mobile encampments and they all yeah, come pouring. Oh, it, shanty towns of goblins on the move. <laughs> yeah, so they all come pouring through the passes and the dwarves are sealed up. Like the dwarves go into their yep. holds. So the goblins have complete free reign. Like Peak Pass, all those super famous passes where the dwarves usually check the people passing through, the dwarves do not get involved. They stay in their holds, maybe fire off a couple cannon shots. But other than that, they do not come out. And so the greenskins want to fight somebody. They want something thrilling. And while some of the green skins almost surely do lay because the other thing that's actually really clever about Grom, though he didn't do it on purpose, is that Grom, because he keeps moving uh, and because he's not trying to bully his tribes into doing what he wants, he just goes where he pleases. And a lot of the goblins want to stay with him and follow. Hey, Carmine, I do like to have someone close by to me. Hey, nice to see I you out there. Much. And thank um, you very much for saying we're magic. That's the thing that Grom it. accidentally does, because his wall is so big, is that a lot of the tribes following him will offshoot and stay in a place. So they'll lay siege mm -hmm. to the places he passes. So yep. the thing about Grom is that a lot of his predecessors will end up laying siege to a particular place, or they go straight for a place. So eventually someone's able to get behind them and come and start attacking them from the rear. You cannot attack Grom from the rear, because there yep. is no rear. It's a sea of greenskins that never ends. Yeah. yeah, his wa is quite unlike anything else. And to give an idea of just how impressive it is, when the focal point of the wa starts turning towards the empire and Grom himself comes down from the mountains and all of the goblins that have been coming out of the forests of the empire turn around and go, what, well, we're going this way. When all of the ones that are coming over the world's edge come in. So Sterling gets attacked, Averlan gets attacked, Talibiklan gets attacked, mm -hmm. Kislev gets attacked. And within a year, the Great Forest, which is pretty much most of the center of the empire, is now completely goblin controlled. There's almost nothing in there. He's taken out the beastmen. He's pushed them aside. He's taken out the various imperial forces, pushed them aside. Pretty much everything that was in the way either becomes enslaved, captured, or deadified as they just sweep their way through. And it is horrific. No other way of describing it. So awful that the emperor of the empire, upon hearing this, goes, <laughs> "Hell, shit!" Um, so, 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 Nuln, which is currently in a state of half destruction because of everything he's been doing to rebuild it, is not really the most defensible of locations. So he says, "I'm off to Altdorf." Heads over to Altdorf, which is surrounded by marshes and high walls and very easy to defend in comparison to Nuln, which is sitting on a confluence of a river and half of it's in a state of disheveled unbuilding. Heads over to Nuln and buckles down and hides, along with all the uh, good old priests of Sigmar. But Grom does indeed hear of where the imperial capital is, which is Nuln. So he sends folks to go sack Nuln. Yeah, and to make matters worse and to kind of point out how cowardly and much of a selfish dickhead that Dieter is he still hasn't summoned the armies of the the empire he yeah. still has not sent out the call to all the electric counts and said hey we need everybody to get together let's get all our armies together and maybe we can like fight grom somewhere no he refuses to do it he literally tucks his tail between his legs and he runs away he takes a lot of money with him and he takes a lot of he, he takes his entire personal guard, which is yeah, pretty yeah, much the entire garrison guard. of Nome, um, to leave all the other people in Nome to just die horribly. Um, he just pieces out because he's, he does. he's a horrible emperor. Okay, so now let's get an idea of what happens. And now this is relatively, this might sound short, but it's not that short given just how quickly they've taken the much less defended east of the empire. As they move into the west, they hit the Reichland and Nome. Nuln gets besieged and falls in short order. This is Nuln sacked. So if uh, you're thinking of Nuln, and if you're ever playing in a game of Warhammer fantasy roleplay, 
100 years ago, Nulm was completely flattened, and the Greenskins swept through that. They then sweep into the Reichland. Now, Reichland, about 2420 now to 2424, is gone. Pretty much all the forests are filled with goblins. All of the major cities suck themselves in, and Reichland goes to war properly. And Reichland actually holds off against Grom. And here we get a really strong idea of what Grom's personality is like. Grom is now coming along with his wah into the forests, and he's conquering everything as he goes. And at this point, he kind of gets bored. Yep. I do want to interrupt real quick for just a couple mm -hmm. of interesting things about the Siege of Gnome. Uh, just some like yes. just little we'll sides of that. First of all, uh, and you may see this if you play uh, Total War, but Grom, um, as Andy talked about earlier, Grom hits one of it, and this is likely what actually gives Reichland the time to amass their armies, is that Grom falls into one of his typical, okay, I've exerted myself, I want to sit for a minute. When he gets to Noel, he actually stops for a bit in that he takes over the city and, uh, oh, hello, what are you doing here? <laughs> Sorry, dog. But uh, he takes over the city and what's interesting is Grom actually sets him up, self up, probably because Noln is so fancy and there's all this gold and riches that have been left behind because yeah, Dieter right. took a lot with him, but he couldn't take everything with him. And he had he literally a golden palace. The go a literal golden palace, um, which and, he destroys. Yeah, Grom, who is on Grom. the uh, Grom is on the second version of his chariot by this point, because he had his original version, then he got a better version when all the goblins from the wolf lands came over in the World's Edge Mountains. Now he builds the third version, which is the fancy one, because he uses the golden palace, the all the fancy materials from it, to build a very nice chariot. For himself. It's going to get destroyed pretty soon, though. Yes, it is. And uh, <laughs> he ends up hosting races in Nuln. They The Greenskins start having chariot races running around Nuln, and it's implied there are actually human survivors that managed to somehow hide in, like, the sewers or some other place in Nuln who are literally trapped in a hellscape version of Mario Kart with Greenskins. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a really nice board that was made by um, Ralph Horsley. Um, for a game that was never released. Um, I believe it's up on his art pages somewhere. If you want to go find it, search for Ralph Horsley. And it's the green skin Warhammer uh, chariot races. And that's pretty much from this era. Uh, see before end? Oh, what do you say there? Pet oh, dog? That, no, that, that dog is my brother's dog who is visiting. Um, I don't know where she came from, but uh, <laughs> she just Okay, up. so he gets bored. That, that, that's that's actually the yeah. bit I was referring to. Yeah, he gets yes. bored of, of the war, the constant war. His forces are going all over the place. They're moving into the Reichland. They're destroying the Reichland. And Reichland defends itself uh, properly. And at the head of that is the Prince of Altdorf, Wilhelm. And Wilhelm mm -hmm. comes out with force after force, striking down into the forest to defend, effectively, the breadbasket. Now, if you don't know the breadbasket, the, uh, the Reichland, it's called the Vorbergland. It, the Vorberg land is in before the mountains. It's the stretch of very fertile land between the Grey Mountains and the forests. And that is prime wolf rider territory, um, which meant that he needed to effectively go to war with them in what is the goblin's natural place for fighting wars. And Wilhelm does pretty well. He loses about a third of the Vorberg land. Um, we're talking about up to Ubersreich area, if you know your Warhammer maps. Speaking of Ubersreich. <laughs> yeah. Uber's right does not fare well with Grom <laughs> poor, at poor all. Uber's right. I think I don't know of a city that has been blown up as many times as <laughs> Uber's right has been. This is where Uber's right really goes through hell. It's taken over. There's there's daubed orky script all over the walls. Does, the, is this... the citizens go down into the sewers beneath. Um, and hide while Grom sacks the place. Yeah, but luckily for them, Grom doesn't stay in one place very long. Oh, it's worth saying, uh, though. It's not Grom. It's his horde. His horde yeah. sacks it. But it's around about here, in this area, that he's held back, and the armies of the Reichland hold him back. And because Grom is currently sitting in Nuln, and also over into the Great Forest, and down into Averland, and passing back up, he's often on his chariot doing shit, but he's kind of stuck. He's no longer got the great desire to fight forwards because ultimately he's not an orc. Orcs are generally the ones that drive and they don't stop them. They're basically like on they're on drugs and they're on the drug of the great wah. And it's filling them with this need to just keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm. And the 
orcs have got that impetus and they're milling around all over the place attacking anything they can yeah Where there the are some the there are some hilarious notes that they're like black orc war bosses and regular orc war bosses who really want grom to do stuff and like he's got this like advisor council of orcs they're like we should attack here or here or here and grom's like uh, i don't i just don't want to like i just that sounds like a lot of work i don't <laughs> i don't want to deal with that how would the vermintide five view grom as literally an unstoppable threat yeah, I mean, um, um, he, but it would be green tide in this particular case because it would yeah, just be an like unending. Getting to Grom would be a fucking nightmare. Yeah, um, it really would. And it was nah. right. You wouldn't even see Grom. Like, you're literally just fighting the detriment, you know, like the random offshoots of Grom's army, which would still be borderline unstoppable. Totally. However, so we're now at approximately 24 24. Okay, so we've had a good 24 years worth of this green skin wah. Think how long that is. It's yeah. really long. Most of um, last for like a handful of years. Like a, a year for off. The, some of the most famous ones only last a couple of years. He's hmm. been going for 24 so far and has consolidated himself in the Imperial capital, which is now effectively his capital. He's sitting in it <laughs> doing his thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm having my chariot race. However, one of his advisors, an orc shaman, good old Blacktooth, eventually has... A vision. A vision, yes. A thing that must be done that has come from Orc and Gork. And he says two things that are particularly important. Number one is, and it's a big one, take to the seas. Because it's going to be slightly piratical if you're doing that. Because, importantly, Gork and Mork has new lands to crush. And that was apparently enough to stir... Grom from his chariot yeah. either northward. He's, either he's particularly pious, or more likely he heard the word new and was like, oh, something something new and exciting because there's no there's no one worth fighting here. This is boring. And I think actually that's nailed it. Um, Grom, let's think of his psychology up to this point. He started back in the late 2300s and he, since then, we're now sitting at about 24, 24 24, 25. It's about 100 years before the end of the actual world and the end times. Um, he's sitting there having fought an unnumbered number of battles and succeeded. He's won again and again and again and again. The dwarves are terrified of him. They've, they've sucked themselves back to their holds. And taking down any one of those holds will take forever. And he doesn't have the patience for it. He's basically like an ADHD goblin. Most goblins are. Um, <laughs> yeah. They don't have patience for this shit. Um, he sees the next battle sitting in front of him and he goes towards it. And he beats that one. He goes towards the next one. He beats that one. In many respects, his great success is that he doesn't do what the orcs did, as we've said several times. He doesn't get fixated on taking down holds. He just gets fixated on the next battle on the chain. And he wins the ball and he grows bored. And he sits and does chariot races and whatever the hell else he fancies. And then he's given a divine vision of an entirely different set of lands that he can crush. And they are going to be hard to fight. And it clearly sparks something in him because Grom mm -hmm. immediately goes, right, we're off. But being a classic goblin doesn't exactly know where the sea is or where to go. <laughs> so he just goes the, the natural direction and heads north, which means... He starts going upwards towards... Now, if you follow the arrows that the map says, yes, says Wah goes, he goes to Marienburg, but he doesn't at all. No, In no, any no. way, shape, or form, nope. he doesn't go anywhere near there. He heads north past Altdorf. He's like, yeah, fuck you. Goes through there, goes through the mid the Midden Moors, through the Mirror Moors, wipes out all the gnomes there, which is why we have no gnomes in modern-day Warhammer, destroys them, then passes through into Middenland, meets the Electra Count of Middenland, and goes, hey, let's have a battle. Kicks the living shit out of him. And here's one. Here's one that to this day I don't understand. So, somehow, well, there's definitely a doggy there having fun. There's, there's two. <laughs> hey, there might be more if you're not careful, assuming yeah. that that could occur. Um, he somehow arrives at Middenheim, has a big old fight there, gets into Middenheim, somehow with a chariot somehow beats up the enormous high temple of ulric takes planks from the top of its roofing takes those down leaves 
and builds himself another chariot because they let the Count of Middenland had destroyed his last golden one, and he was pretty fucking upset about it. Yeah. So, um, so couple, how he got up there? <laughs> yeah. So a couple things worth worth throwing in here uh, that I think are interesting about Grom is that one is for people that may be wondering, okay, well, if Reichland's going out and fighting, why didn't Grom just smash them? There is actually a Black Library story that addresses this. That's very interesting, which suggests that Grom lost one important battle, where Grom, for the first time in his life, got actually hurt. Because he ends up fighting, I think it was Prince Wilhelm, um, who has a right uh, one of the rune fangs, and rune this fangs. particular rune fang was troll hewer. Um, wouldn't mean if it was his, but let's see, yeah, it is. It's, it's, <laughs> one, it's the one that does um, that burns. I forget. Which I mean, one yeah. Is. I mean, that will do. I mean, troll hewer would kill uh, yeah, it might, it might enormous damage Wilhelm. to him. It might have been. Um, I don't think it was Prince Wilhelm. It might have been somebody else. Um, uh, but, Grimzone would have done it, um, or it's got different names, but it doesn't matter. It's a rune yeah. fang. Anyway, he gets stabbed by a rune fang, and this just particular seen, rune uh, fang. In the word Hammond, what's it going to be? Praise be Lord Gorkamorsis Green. <laughs> yes, yeah, that is Grom. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. No, no, yeah. fair. Uh, that looked good. Uh, so <laughs> I was expecting a terrible pun. Yeah, and I will say the book. Uh, it's I don't know how accurately it fits with Grom's story, uh, but it is it is a very fun story because it's portrayed it from a human perspective, and you get to see Grom from a human perspective, which shows him as terrifying. Because from a green skin perspective, he's kind of hilarious, but from a human perspective, he is genuinely horribly frightening. But he gets stabbed by a rune fang, and for the first time in a long time, it actually hurts him because the blade is magical enough that it burns him. Because for those who don't know, despite the fact in the battle game, they don't portray this. All the rune fangs have unique properties, um, which are really, really fun. They all have like different ways they affect things. And one of them can basically burn the shit out of you. And that's the one that stabs Grom. And if there's one thing you need against regen, it's fire. Fire. And Grom goes, holy shit, this hurt. And he smacks that guy and he runs away. And uh, Classic this, goblin tactic. Yeah. This I didn't have, lose. Yeah, I just I ran. Uh, yeah, I did a tactical <laughs> retreat. But uh, now this could have led to Grom just sitting in a stupor and Nuln irritated that he lost finally before old Blacktooth spurs him. But as Andy said, he goes Arguably, north. it's a good piece of motivation for that, at least. Yeah. So he goes yeah. north and there is a hysterical battle that I would pay to see this animated where Grom's chariot gets hit with a cannon. Uh, by I'm talking about that, <laughs> yeah. So the Mittenheimers actually yeah. go out to fight, and they make a good show of it. And one of them shoots Grom and blows up his chariot, which infuriates him because this was his fancy chariot. So it Grom was. gets up and he turns to his advisors and goes, "Where are those blue umis from?" And they're like, "Oh, they're from this city over here." And he goes, "I'm gonna go make a new chariot out of their shit." And he walks to Mittenheim because he's that mad about it. So he walks all the way to Mittenheim with his army. They somehow break into the so, gates. Like this here, part, this I don't part understand makes how this sense. happens. Okay, that this this there is a, a standard story with Benheim in that it has never fallen underneath standard definitions of these things, but it definitely hasn't at this point. Middenheim expressly does not fall and is not apparently uh proper its walls don't go down, they don't blow their cat uh their cas they've got big huge uh, ramps, let's call them ramps, big huge causeways that lead up to the main uh, gates of Middenheim. And these are really long and they can be blown up if there's a siege. Effectively, Middenheim is impregnable. And somehow, Grom gets in there. I think the most obvious thing is that they come up, they surround it, and uh, wyverns steal bits of wood from the top of their temple, fly off, Grom's happy with those bits, builds himself a new chariot and moves on. That allows all the various versions of the lore to stand, but it is literally a castaway line that's dropped all the way back in the fourth edition version of Warhammer, where Grom passes Middenheim, and as they call it there, as I recall, it's not even called the High Temple or anything similar, it's just the Temple of Ulrich. Um, and they take bits yeah. of wood from the Temple of Ulrich and use that to create the next chariot that he uses as he passes north into Nordland. Um, it's a fascinating battle because it doesn't make sense. It's castaway lines yeah. every single time. So, so in the in the eighth, that's kind of a weird specific thing. So in the eighth edition, it says it's the roof timbers, roof timbers of the Temple of the White Wolf. Which, well, there we go. Uh, which I don't. That's not what the high temple's no, called. No, it's yeah. not. That's, that's so, not what the high temple's called. Yeah. Now, that could just be a writer <laughs> error. But uh, 
high. Yes, it's cool. a weird one. Yeah. So what we know is new chariot. Yeah, I will say I would if you're ever a writer out there and you want to have fun with it, there could be some really funny ways to say how Grom got the roof off the if it was the high temple, which hilariously would make it even more hilarious because it's not really even implied that he takes the city, just that he somehow got that roof, which yeah. could be. You know, maybe a, he sent in a group of goblins that snuck in through the fosh log and they managed to get up to the temple. <laughs> or they the flew off, in! And there was a whole incident of a swarm <laughs> of goblins running away through the streets of Vindheim being chased with the roof from the high temple, which sounds fucking <laughs> hilarious. It does! That yeah. sounds fun! Yeah, or um, a wyvern grab it or something. But it, Gromham doesn't take the city. He just takes this roof and then leaves. Um, but he makes a new chariot out of it and that is his second to last chariot it's not his last yeah. one but it's the second to last one um but they take the roof and he uses a holy sacred piece of wood to make his new chariot and they run off to uh nordland where they originally nordland. arrive on the coast and grom says build a bunch of ships and everyone goes what <laughs> he says build the ships or i'll kill you and uh they uh, spend and then, a year in nordland and he kills a lot of them yeah, and this a is war, um, a lot of war bosses die. A lot of orc war bosses die at this point. There's lots of challenges to Grom's leadership because Grom, by this point, has moved past the Grom of the of previously, where Grom was just what fought our arson around, winning battle after battle, doing whatever he wished. Now he's got purpose, and apparently, this purpose, purpose is enough that he's going to go and attack his own forces again and again and again. He kills multiple war bosses. And it also shows the strength of Grom by this point as well, where the various war bosses that are under his control, all of whom are pretty goddamn freaking hard, are getting hewn down by him whenever they say no. Uh, the first time that you see Grom doing what normal war bosses do, which is take out those who try and present themselves as potential threats or who will alternatively try and break up the WA. He, in many respects, channels the WA for the first time and heads it out to sea. There is, I think, also worth one other thing worth discussing as we pass through here. Two um, more clearly, opinion, but I'll take your. So what do you okay? Got? Let's let, let's see where we go through. First, we're going through Nordland, and arguably, this is the point where Nordland becomes super weak as a province mm. because he uh, the Greenskin Horde sweeps through and takes up most of the northern coastline, and that uh, explains many reasons why the northern coastline doesn't have the great ports that it should have. At this point, they're sacked, they're taken out, the humans are enslaved to build them ships or whatever else they may have, and we know what orc ships are like, big paddles and horrible raggedy sails. Oops. Thank you, Gary. And uh, Bla I actually, Blacktooth ha seems very good at manipulating Grom. So, um, I have a theory about this, but I'm not going to do it until we hit Elthuin, as yeah. in what Blacktooth is doing. Yeah, Blacktooth, because Blacktooth is better to save into the Ulthuan portion, because that's when a lot of his revealed stuff. is doing shit, and Blacktooth has got more than enough information to understand what he's doing by this point, and Blacktooth definitely has a plan. So Blacktooth is goading Grom on. They're building this fleet, but as they pass through Nordland, we have a reason for why Nordland is a freaking mess come modern times. But we also have a big question that pops up. And what happens with the Eonir? Um, we know that the Eonir are not in bad shape come modern times. Elves if anything, of, uh, the, the quote-unquote wood elves of Laralorn, for anyone that doesn't know what Eonir are. Yeah, exactly. So I think, broadly speaking, the answer for this is easy. Grom's horde now has purpose, and it's going north. And elves aren't stupid. Yeah, I. It, it's it just also withdraw. worth saying that Grom seems to really struggle with enemies that hide from him because everyone that hides from him basically survives. Whether they pull into a city and just close all the gates, or they genuinely just hide, Grom doesn't. He just moves too fast, and so there are parts of his army that I'm sure swarmed into Larlorn and got obliterated. Because mm -hmm. what else are actually very good at dealing with greenskins? Because oh, they yeah. spike them from trees and other high places. And greenskins are very easily spooked. Um, a lot of people don't think they are, but they're very superstitious. Goblins in particular. Goblins. Yeah. Um, it's worth mentioning goblins are actually terrified of elves. Completely oh, yeah. Or, yeah, terrified like, of them. To a full-on um, for their rules. Yeah, yeah. They, in the rules they're terrified of them so um we have a lovely combination here of a force that they're terrified of and grom's purpose and grom's purpose is not the elves they don't matter to him grom's purpose is to get to the sea and once he reaches the north of nordland 
He's at the sea. This is his purpose. Yeah, so I'm art building. Yeah, I would bet uh, if like you ever want to do some stuff with Laurel and you're building a character, talking about if your elf was present when Grom's hordes came into Laurel could be a lot of fun and like some of the fighting that happened and stuff. Because I'm sure it was nasty, but they got through it pr relatively unscathed. However, there Absolutely. was a people that suffered also really badly, which were the gnomes. Um, if you care to talk about them, which I love them. I, I, I think their newest version is actually a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned them um, a little bit earlier when they passed through the Mirror Moors and the gnomes yeah. here were utterly eradicated. Um, the orc Wa moves through and the Wa energy, the magical energy that comes along with the orcs, disrupted and completely tore down many of the illusions that they had spread across the moors, meaning that many of the old uh, burrows that they, uh, many of the old burrows that the gnomes used were completely open and they just went down and they killed almost all of them um they weren't just decimated that one in ten line they were the exact opposite only one in ten maybe survived that horrible horrible attack yeah the gnomes uh this is literally like kind of the hand wave reason when they got brought back mm -hmm. in wolf Rup of why you don't see them and why they're believed to be a myth is that their population was obliterated to where they have one burrow left great burrow they have one great burrow left and that's it um and now, it's that's that's not strictly true well, um, because I, mean, I, 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 I wrote that I wrote this bit so I can I can give into the uh, little divey devil you little bit. You please do. Um, Wait, do you um, want to do this first? Uh, uh, let's do this first. Priest of Ulrich, and oh, go for it. Oh yeah, Priest of Ulrich, hands on his head, staring at the missing roof of the temple next morning, deciding whose fault this is, <laughs> so they can clean the poo and get Roy was here. Get Roy was here. <laughs> okay, so tell us about gnomes, Andy. Okay, so um. Uh, the books that were created for the first wave of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay are all Reichland specific. Um, so the gnome position that's presented in Rough Nights and Hard Days, which is one of the books for Warhammer Fantasy roleplay four, um, are the Reichlander gnomes, and that is the Mirror Moor ones that sit just on the northern border of the Reichland, and they are utterly wiped out. But there's also a couple of paragraphs in there explaining that there are other gnomes. There's some over in the Kulsa Hills in Talibic land. There's some over in Old Stire land, just north of the Mutland. There's uh, some all the way up by Middenland, and they're mentioned, but mentioned only. So there are other burrows out there with many more gnomes, but it was specifically written into this one, largely to ensure that there was, as was very clearly put forward, a reason for why gnomes don't pop up all over the place in the warmer world or are advisors in total war or whatever is because they were, at least in this group, wiped out entirely. This used to be the biggest number that there was, and the rest of them are like, whoa, fuck! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. stay down, stay down! But, and uh... they are the masters of Ulgu, the masters of shadow magic, the masters of hiding. They can also do dark magic as well, which is not commonly discussed. Um, and the gnomes have been on the run ever since Teclis in installed the Colleges of Magic and outlawed many of the magics that the gnomes did anyway. They got persecuted by witch hunters, so they have learned to keep their heads down. So that was all written to have a justification for why they weren't there in the first place. I mean, that'll make a fun, interesting stream in the future, actually, I think. Um, <laughs> yes, it would, but I it is worth noting them with the whole Grom thing because that's a big it part. It absolutely is because um, Grom is the reason that I used to explain why there are gnomes. And it works really nicely because it ties them into the existing Warhammer world. Rather than just simply saying they are secretive and shy, it's no, the existing Warhammer world as it is, it's war. Sometimes they lose and they lost badly. Grom kicked their freaking arse as he passed through. Yeah, so uh, like Andy said, Grom goes to sea uh, with his ramshackle fleet. And what's interesting to know at this point is that Grom is constantly getting new tribes, but he's also losing a lot of tribes. So when Grom decides to leave Nuln and go north to make a fleet, he doesn't wait for anybody. Like, he doesn't nope. be like, oh, everybody get together, we're going north. He just goes, and whoever happens to be around goes with him. But I think it's like he loses like two-thirds of now, uh, let, let, there's more to say before we hit the two thirds. Um, so there's a couple of things. One is how many does he get to the sea? And the answer is it's an orc tide, unlike one that has ever been put to sea before. So first, even though almost all of the empire is now loosely speaking his kingdom, all of the world's edge mountains is and everywhere else, he puts out the call and says it's here or nothing. Fuck yeah basically. Yeah. And they all come swarming up north, all the ones who are loyal, all the ones who aren't fighting other battles elsewhere, all the ones that aren't leaving the Empire in a complete 
date. And when Grom leaves, it is. Oh. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> two Ulrich priests are talking. Do you see that comment, brother? Do you know what it means? That Sigmar is ascendant? It means someone took our roof. <laughs> Honestly, there could be some really hilarious, like, comic panel type jokes about how the Ulrichans handled finding out the roof was gone. <laughs> I think there's a great story there. Um, so the legacy of Grom is about to be understood for the Empire. So I think it's worth pausing here just to say, what does he leave the Empire with? He leaves the Empire with raised villages and towns from almost end to end. The only place that properly held off Grom was a part of the Reichland. And even that is not very in a great place, but at least the breadbasket of Reichland survives. The Emperor is left in Altdorf. All the primary cities are still in place except for Nuln, which was sacked. And there are now greenskins everywhere. And these will become the key tribes that are located in the Empire for the next hundred years. So a hundred years later, when you see your modern maps of the Empire, you see a little greenskin tribe perhaps marked as being in one forest or another. It's probably there because of Grom and the troops that were left behind. Um, yeah, the, the Empire completely loses control of the forests and they never get it back basically like this yeah. was like magnus magnus did a really good job claiming a lot of the empire back from the quote-unquote forces of darkness and this is kind of where all of that work just goes tits up yeah totally um it is an uh it is pretty much a defining moment for the empire for two reasons one it shows that the great strength, the imperial might of the empire that had been established by Magnus is now not just weakening, but is almost at a tipping point where it's coming to an end. But it also establishes an entirely new ruling family. Not today. It's not going to be for about another five or six years before em Emperor Dieter is eventually kicked out, as we're about to find out why. Um, but a new imperial family will come to rule, and it probably would not have occurred if it hadn't been for Grom and the military successes of Prince Wilhelm and the complete failure, and I do mean absolute, utter failure of Dieter Goldgatherer, the worst emperor who ever worsted up in Altdorf as he currently is. So yeah. we have ourselves this enormous, enormous fleet gathering in the north on the Sea of Claws, and it is pretty much not just a, like a mile long, 10 miles long. It's just green skins from horizon to horizon that are put to sea on terrible shack-like boats. <laughs> They've got rotten, um, assuming they even have sails, and it's not just goblins running around pushing along paddles. Um, this is the worst fleet you've ever seen, but it's also terrifying. It's huge, enormously huge. Marienburg immediately goes, we have to do something about this. And for the first time, when the Iron Bird puts out the call to Dieter, Dieter responds. And he says, I'll help. And sends the Imperial fleet down yes. there. Now, you could argue that was Dieter. But I think if you're going with the story of Dieter, because it, it's never said that Dieter does it. It just says that the Imperial fleet goes. Far more likely, the Admiralty, the group of admirals who are responsible for the first fleet, got together, the admiral's board, and they went, yeah, we need to stop this fleet somehow. And currently it's weak because orcs on land, terrifying. Greenskins on land, terrifying. But at sea, we have the advantage. Mm. Well, it's also worth saying, though, <laughs> that the Imperial <laughs> First Fleet is not the best fleet in the world. Yeah, um, so in, um, in, in the Reich. Yeah, in 8th edition, there's a really hilarious note about that when Grom initially sets off. I think I think the authors um, goofed a little bit with the nature of the fleet because it almost very strongly implies that the fleet sets off from either Nordland or one of the other oh. Sea of Claw groups uh, because the, it says that they shadow Grom for a while where they just kind of follow Grom's fleet because they're like, okay, we don't want to fight this thing because there's so many fucking greenskins. But at the same time, we do need to keep an eye on them. And then Grom's fleet, on probably more by accident, comes all the way around the coast and starts heading oh. towards Marienburg. And that's when the Imperial fleet goes, fuck, okay, we have to fight them. You've got to remember, at this point, Marienburg is a part of the Empire. Mm. Um, it, I don't forget this. Not but this, this, <laughs> this will not last for long because Marienburg is about to get a massive advantage. It's your... Yeah, see. Admiral von Kronitz. Oh, well remembered. Well, not well remembered. You've got the book in front of you. <laughs> they come down. I knew where to and <laughs> we have a massive naval battle, and the orcs mm -hmm. win. 
The Orcs win easily. The Orcs <laughs> win hand down. The Orcs <laughs> kick their butts. The Imperial Navy is shattered. The one from both Marienburg, the one that's come because the Imperial First Navy is based in Marienburg. Um, uh, the ships that have come down from Reichland, shattered. The ones that have come from uh, Midland, shattered. The ones that have come from the north, shattered. The ones that come from elsewhere, utterly sunk. The fleet is left with a, a skeleton force in comparison to what it had before. And that's obviously not great, particularly yeah, because we now have more greenskins sitting uh, ready to attack Marienburg than you can possibly imagine. But yeah, so just, just to put it into perspective, we're talking about a like a sizable fleet with very supposedly very well trained marines who have cannons, gunpowder, uh, some have wizards, pegasi, griffins, and they get fucked because there's just so many greenskins. Now, I don't often bring up a comment, but I'm going to uh, take this one directly because I wrote all the Imperial Fleet stuff. Um, the first fleet is a river fleet designed for boarding actions. That is correct in the modern day, but this is before Marienburg succeeds. This is not a river fleet. This is an actual maritime fleet that's based in Marienburg and Altdorf as well by the Reichsport. But it doesn't move to the Reichsport until Marienburg succeeds, which it has not yet done. So at the moment, mm -hmm. this is a proper sea fleet with access to the sea and training at sea. This is before the Imperial First Fleet becomes an absolute nightmare of terrible captains. Yeah, um, also, so uh, worth yeah. mentioning there. Yeah, because of what's about to happen, this is probably really the last time in, before the world blows up that the Empire actually had a good Navy. <laughs> It is. And even when the world grows up, it's not the best navy in the world. Although Nordland builds the Imperial Second Fleet and arguably is pretty damn good at it. But that's way, way, way in the yeah. future from that. So, as Andy was saying, uh, something happens, which is, from the Empire's perspective, a fucking miracle. Uh, which is that yeah, a storm it's shows a miracle. up. Um, yeah, it's not a miracle. So, this giant, titanic, uh, unholy storm shows up. And the Greenskins don't have a way to navigate by their own will. They go wherever their piece of garbage is going to happen to float. And yeah. their entire fleet goes away. <laughs> now, yeah, some so of them hilariously end up, to put it on how bad this storm is, the entire Greenskin fleet just vanishes from the yeah. Marienburg perspective. None of the Greenskins make it to Marienburg. However, a significant amount of Grom's fleet shipwrecks not in Marienburg, not in the empire in bretonia they get pushed all the way out and around up the marches of Caron and just are obliterated against bretonia against the rocks um a most of them get sunk on the rocks there it's absolutely horrible for the greenskin perspective um truly nasty stuff right so there's a couple of things that are worth saying here um there's no such thing as a coincidence in the warhammer world true um there are loosely two obvious answers here and there's one that i prefer personally but there's not an answer so that actually i'm going to contradict myself there's three number one it's an accident as in this is just nature responding and i think that's a bullshit answer <laughs> largely because everyone would have seen that storm coming beforehand storms don't just arrive there would have been that rumbling as it moved its way in. The oh, next yeah. one the is answer from Sertison. The slant <laughs> did it. <laughs> I'm not going to go with the slant because I think there are local forces that are far more likely to intervene, and the slant very rarely intervene on that a distance and affair in a way that literally doesn't affect I, yeah, them I don't, I don't, I don't or do anything. <laughs> Although I can make an argument for saying that it is, but we can do that at the end. Um, Andy, the next, your, like, put your spec your camera. Um, is it not camera, doing camera. camera? Yeah, there you go. Mm. Huh? Oh, I'm out of focus. And who wants to there, look at uh, me uh, anyway? Uh, oh, there go. oh, oh, yeah, oh, there we go. Okay, hey, oh, we're good. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to see your beautiful face when you were talking. Oh, oh my light being blurry. <laughs> I don't look as old. Right, anyway, moving past the blurry oldness. Um, the next most obvious one is that Manan did it. Now, this is very Marienburg. Manan, Marienburg. Ma the, the very sea that the fleet was in is the Manan Spurt Sea, which is Manan's blessed, bounteous ocean. Um, and the idea that Manan or the priests of Manan did something to summon a storm is likely. Hmm. And that doesn't seem beyond the pale in terms of an interpretation of this event. However, the orcs themselves, the wine energy that they, that's involved with it might have made that an interesting combat. Triton kicking around in there somewhere, having a laugh. That could have been fun. <laughs> 
But I think if you're looking to build an interesting and good story, what you really want it to be is the High Elves. Now, the High Elves have got themselves a significant quarter in Marienburg that they have a strong treaty with the Empire that's saying that they will defend it. It is their responsibility to defend the city while they're trading with them there. Now, why would I want to make it the High Elves? Because the results of their actions, the results of pulling in the sea, dooms Yvres. Yeah, utterly the, oh, dooms man. it. I um, genuinely love the idea that the sea elves, which for anyone confused, the sea elves are what the high elves that live in Marienburg are typically called to try yeah, and parse things out. But yeah, if uh, they were responsible, that would be a fucking huge bomb if that dropped at some point in a narrative. Yeah. And that, uh, it speaks to um, the knock-on effects and the repercussions, the consequences of action that the Warhammer world and its storytelling is known for. Whenever you have a victory, in fact, that victory is undercut by something else. And the idea that the elves were responsible for this, they summoned a great squall, which swirled around the fleet, sent it off elsewhere, and they're like, we have saved you, you fucking owe us now. We want to have more independence. We don't want to be tied down to the uh, Empire. We want Marienburg to be completely separate. So we have magical rule here, not others. You can see the politics. High elves are political. And mm -hmm. even if you, the, the sea elves are just high elves, they're, that's just yep. what they are. These high elves are super political to the point that they have special rules saying that the most powerful character, it might not even be your general. It could be some other little champion purely because that character is the one that's got the leadership capabilities or the political right or whatever it may be. They're constantly uh, trying to maneuver into the best. Marienburg is about to succeed. Um, the empire's forces are shattered, utterly ruined. The worst emperor in the world is reeling from the situation that they're in, attempting to patch it all up. Marienburg is about to succeed. It makes sense with the elves providing them with support for doing this. They take advantage of the situation. They put the politics forward. And then the Gork fleet is gone. It's no longer their issue. Except it isn't. Because after all, Gork and Mork wanted them to go to sea for a reason. Yeah. And uh, and there are potentially other parties that may have been behind the storm, though I do really like the idea of the sea elves, and it ties very well into how the Warhammer world works. Was, um, especially when the sea god like Manon of such a big ritual would have come at a cost that they were not keenly enough aware of. Manon didn't do it, it was McGramps. I, I just you had to see it out loud for me. <laughs> I saw Andy being like, what is what is <laughs> but when you said it out loud, I was like, oh, <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> Hammond, that was bad. I I, I, was, I wasn't seeing it in my head properly. Yeah. So Grom's fleet, uh, as far as they're concerned, they're they are out at sea, and uh, it is not good for them. A lot of them sink in the storm, and then Dude. they're just wandering aimlessly across the ocean. Um, and they wander, days. and they wander. It's only thirty wander. days. Uh, forty, in, at least in eighth edition, they say forty nights. It's, 40. it's only forty nights. Um, <laughs> it's not that long. Um, that, that was from my memory, so it probably is 40 in all of them. <laughs> it's yeah, it's only 40, so it's not that long. Um, in the greater scheme of things, it's obviously terrible, and they're at sea and they're bickering and they're they're chopping each other. Some of them have got purpose, drill killers are driving into their own vessels. It's all bad <laughs> because or I'm sure they were attacked by fish people, absolutely. Yeah, indeed. And uh, the force is Grom's mighty wa that went to sea has been taken down to much like it had done as it passed through elsewhere it's been taken down to a tiny fraction of its original size maybe down to as little as a tenth if not smaller what survives to eventually arrive at Ulthuin is very small but there's a couple of things you have to say about how big it still is number one it's big enough that the Y energy that's coming along with it pierces through the shifting sands now the shifting sands the entirety of the, oh, the east coast eyes. Yeah, the shifting isles. Yeah, the entirety of the east coast of Ulthuin are covered with all manner of magics to ensure that nothing can invade there. It is their safe boundary. Absolutely, nout can get across this, but somehow they do. I have a theory for how they do this beyond just it was orcs, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> but we're going to get to that in a moment. And they crash into these isles and they spread out from that point with Grom needing a new chariot because his last one's gone. <laughs> yeah, so what's what's worth noting is that getting to Ulthuan from the east is supposed yes. to be genuinely impossible. Like, yeah. the only time it happens, it's usually a freak accident 
with like a single ship or a very small selection of ships. Grom makes it in with a wah, which mm-hmm. should not have been possible under any circ. Like even if you take luck into account, should not have been possible. The shifting isles literally move around. They are islands that change places, so ships crash into them. There are mist demons, which are elementals made out of literal mist that attack people, rip them limb from limb, break their brains, all this other stuff. You're not supposed to be able to get to Ulthuan, and Grom makes it with a fucking huge army of greenskins. So the question is, how? How? I mean, how did you do it? Um, by the established lore that is admittedly written after this invasion, in terms of the timelines that said, oh no, not even that, the Orc and Goblin army list came after High Elves. High Elves was the second army list. The first one was Empire. So Empire, High Elves, or Orcs and Goblins. So we've already got established here that it's impossible. He then does the impossible. Now you could argue, oh, it's because Games Workshop wrote the story of this before they made the Shifting Isles. And that's true. They did. But that doesn't change the fact that it's happened which means we now need to look at it and say, how did it happen? And we have an answer if you look between the lines. And that answer is the same orc that set them on this path in the first place. The shaman. Old Blacktooth. Old Blacktooth. Because back back in the, the Empire, Old Blacktooth had been busy. And he'd been busy working away around old ogums, old menhirs, big, huge standing stones. And he'd found that many of these carried enormous quantities of magic, which he himself had been tapping into. Lots of them got turned into orc effigies instead, as they carved orcs onto them. Others, he figured out how to tap, but he realized that there was magic going on, and it becomes somewhat of an obsession. We don't know it's an obsession during the Empire part, we just know that he definitely was involved with them. But by the time we arrive over in Ulthuin, it's not just an obsession, it becomes his raison d'etre. It becomes everything that he is interested in doing. It eventually leads to his death. He is so desperate to get hold of this magical energy. So here is the simple way they got through it. The network that led up to the sands, which the Shifting Isles relies upon the great Vortis for Mm. the magical energy that gets sucked in, was disrupted by the Wah as they just went swept through the Empire and Blacktooth was chopping down key locations which opened up a clean path for the Wa to move through. The answer is probably Blacktooth. Blacktooth is probably the one who managed to allow the impossible to become possible. What if they had oil, though? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. Those elves need doomed. freedom. Let's <laughs> go give freedom to the elves. But, uh... Yeah. So yeah. that gives you an answer. It's not the answer that's written into the text, but we do have an orc that we know is becomes utterly obsessed when they land on the isles and they start pushing forward. They take down stone after stone. And these are the original stones that were used to channel the winds of magic out of the world that were put up by the high elves. And the magics throughout that entire area goes down. And this speaks a lot to high elven hubris as well. The high elves when they do a thing, have got enough pride and arrogance that they think that that thing is now impossible for the lesser species of the world to deal with. So the shifting isles, as far as the high elves are concerned, are impregnable. And I think that using the hubris of the high elves to bring them down is classic Warhammer yeah, storytelling. What, what I want to say to um, add on to Andy's point, because I agree absolutely, is that Old Blacktooth really is the most important character at this point in the story. Like, Grom, oh, yeah. honestly, kind of falls to the wayside. And Old Blacktooth really is... Yeah, and the thing about Old Blacktooth, like Andy said, it is extremely heavily implied, whether intentionally or not, that Blacktooth already knew a lot intimately about the High Elven Waystones before yeah. he arrives in Old One, which yeah. means he was picking them apart in the Empire because they're they're all over the Old World. Uh, especially in the empire probably just use kind of fork a few times just keep keep pushing near the moving phase but um old black tooth he is a very sinister character especially for an orc shaman of all things like yeah. you'd expect him to be maybe a gabo but he's not he's an orc yep. and we don't know exactly where black tooth comes from because he just kind of shows up in gras yep. wam during uh wa during the empire portion and he is the force that drives scrum to the yep. ocean across the ocean and into old one and when he gets there, he turns to Grom and he says, Oi, we're here now, boss. Now we got to go find these big white stones. We got to go find these stones. And I got to do this thing for Gork and Mork, boss. And Grom goes, Okay. And Grom literally just does what Blacktooth tells him to do um, at this point in the story. Almost like Blacktooth is able to 
magically or through just sheer charisma deeply influence Grom. I, I think that we don't necessarily need either of those things given the orcs. We can just simply have him as a vessel of Mork and Gork. Um, he is speaking um, the words of Mork and Gork and, and Grom is ultimately an orc, a goblin, a greenskin who yeah. is following in those particular footsteps. He is the core shaman. And I think um, there's, we have, I agree, so little on this that you have to piece together the narrative by what's hinted at rather than by what's explicitly stated. But yeah. there is clearly a narrative here, which is his name's not just Blacktooth, it's old Blacktooth. He's yeah. proper old. He's an ancient orc shaman. Yeah, Greenskin, yeah, and Greenskins can get fucking old. A lot of people yeah. don't realize Greenskins don't die of old age. Generally. Eh, like, they can. Eh, they but, can. Um, but it, it, like, as long as they're active and they seem to have a purpose, they just keep going. They do, kind of. Um, exactly that. And old Blacktooth is a, he's an old orc. Um, and he's an orc. He's not a goblin. And he has stands at the side of Grom the Paunch throughout most of his wa and doesn't really make a proper imposition until um, Grom has sat in his fat ass for too long. And he says, no, we now need to move and we need to go to see there's something we need to do. Yeah. But you could argue that he didn't say that until he understood why, which meant that the little hints that the various stones have been knocked down by that wa, you then get, well, that was probably Blacktooth. And Blacktooth has a purpose. And his purpose is to get to Ulthuin. And he's possibly already at this point broken the route through yeah and that and that's the thing is that a you have an orc that horrifically understands how the vortex functionally kind of works a little bit and to the point that he may very well likely can see a path and is able to go if i follow this magic it's going to take me where i need to go yeah. and second of all by disrupting those augum stones and waystones back in the empire the magic that's like andy said supplies the shifting isles allows them to do what they do is going to be short circuiting it's not mm. going to be working properly. Which is perfect, because it makes sense for how they got through, it makes sense for how they land, and it also makes sense of his obsession as he gets on the other side, and he starts tearing them all down. Every yep. single last one. And this is so disruptive, so massively disruptive, that Althuin itself starts to shake. Yeah, and it's the elves are not... Bad. They were not prepared. Um, because like Andy said, they are arrogant as fuck, and they mm. never ever prepared for the chance of a land invasion from the east. They just never even considered it as a possibility. Yeah. And so, the orc and the green skins that are with them start doing something that the dark elves would never do in one of their invasions as they come through north, and that's wiping out the very thing that keeps the world safe, as in it drains the magic from the old world and the rest of the world. This great vortice of magic, go watch our Winds of Magic stream, that keeps everything safe is not just getting disrupted, it's beginning to crack. It's beginning to swirl. And as the orcs are advancing and wiping out elves in an, an horrific number, they're completely taken by surprise. They swarm across Yvres. And Yvres will never recover from this. In the hundred years that comes, it's still pretty much a haunted nothing in comparison yeah, to some and of the other to land. add some kind of thoughts of that where we talked about in the old world a lot of those cities and the dwarf holds everything they pulled in and were able to raise up mm. their walls and just wait grom out because grom would just go past them the problem with the elves is they don't have a place like that easily accessible in yvres and a lot of well, elves try to fight have one except <laughs> one which we'll get to in a second <laughs> yeah a lot of the elves try and fight grom defending a bridge or attacking from the forest using tactics that they'd use to get uh so that okay we'll 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 get to that in a second now that's that's a whole thing yeah, well, there's a man, bag of worms thank you for the super chat we will come to that in a minute we're, we're almost man, that's that, a finale here one. where that will come up so uh we have this whole thing of the green skins are massive and the thing about the elves is they haven't had to fight a threat like the Greenskins in Ulthuan, at least in a super fucking long time. Ulthuan doesn't have Beastmen. It doesn't have Greenskins. No. It doesn't even have no. Skaven. They don't deal with these Horde-type enemies. It's usually like some Norskins got super fucking lucky and showed up, or some Warriors of Chaos got lucky and showed up, or it's Dark Elves. Or Demons yeah. come down from the Anuli Mountains. That's pretty much it. So, Completely this true. is like a threat they are not prepared with. They don't understand. Like, they might have the understanding of, oh, we need to kill the war boss. 
but they yeah. don't understand how to defend against a green skin invasion and it's they probably don't even have that to hand um in that if this had been say for example any of the wood elf groups they would have survived this easily they would have retreated at speed and then moved towards somewhere that they could hide or just moved up and towards the annuli where they could have threatened down and um harried them with guerrilla style attacks in an attempt to eventually find the war boss and take them out. But they didn't. This was farmers. This was small communities. Um, disparate lords sitting in their towers. Ladies sitting over there at their repose. Long, slim, beautiful homes that just get washed over. And this is not a long battle. We're talking days and we're at full siege. Um, because there is one major location in the local area, and that's Tor Yavres itself, the capital of the area, a beautiful city of slender towers, high walls, well defended, well defended, because this is where they would all withdraw to if the Dark Elves came. But mm -hmm. they are, in their arrogance, they don't even really see the tide of greenskins as a possibility, as anything that could ever occur, or and most, that much of a threat. So even when someone comes up and says, there's a big tide, green skims coming, they're like, what? No, they can't come from that side. That's a nonsense. I'll go and see myself. Oh, they're out dead. They yeah. just get swashed over. And to, to I, I saw a few people in the chat asking like, oh, where was Teclas? Where's Tyrion? Where are all these other characters? Grom's invasion in Ulthuan is lightning fast. Nobody yeah. has any fucking time to react to what's going on. Because by the time the Hyals re realize that he's there, they're dead. Because he's literally coming down on top of them. Or a lot of them in their typical arrogance think we're high elves. We we fight demons, we fight dark elves, we can handle some green skins. And the lord of uh Tor Ivres, uh the father of Altharian, he leads uh, some of the garrison out to go kill Grom. Like he yeah. leads out a big fight to go fight him. He yep. ends 30, up in, they to their, the main 30 miles outside of Tor Ivres, they do the main uh fight. Yeah, and to be fair to him, they put up a good showing considering how grossly outnumbered they are to the point where yeah. Eltharian's dad makes his way to Grom himself and duels Grom. Yep. And he dies. Because Grom cuts him down. Exactly. And Grom at this point has become almost like a god to his fellow greenskins, especially the goblins. They're terrified mm -hmm. of elves. And Grom has led them to the magic home of the pointy ears. And he's crumping them. These goblins aren't scared of elves anymore, which is huge. Well, they, they are by the rules. <laughs> but not if Grom's um, leading them. Not if Grom's um, leading. No, no, fair, they're, fair, they're fair. Fear if Grom's leading the no charge. Taken. Uh, how would Albion have dealt with Grom's Wa if it had landed there? Or is it possible that part of the Wa made it there? Loosely, it's very possible that part of the Wa landed there. Probably parts of it did. There will be green skins over there that are remnants of Grom's Wa. How yeah. would they have dealt with the entire Wa? Very badly. <laughs> yeah, super <laughs> fucked is the, the long story short. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously lots of local inhabitants who would have individually probably survived because they have to hold themselves the, the up in would have various places. The giants oh, would have been very but yeah. very possibly the giants would end up being enslaved and becoming part of the Wa because that is the way that goblins generally It probably went out well. Yeah, it would not have gone well at all. If Blacktooth ended up in Albion, the world probably just would have ended, to be honest. Um, yeah, it would have been that would have been a so thing. anyway. Siege of Tori of Vress. big fight. Uh, and at this point, we I'm I'm not gonna get super into it, especially because there are so many different versions of how this happens. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. the version that Aethogen goes with is Eltharian hears about this through a dream. Because long story short, Eltharian and a lot of Yvress's forces went out on kind of a crazy raid to Nagaroth. And they successfully deal some serious damage in Nagaroth. Um, but as they are fleeing, Eltharian gets stabbed by a witch elf with a poison dagger, and it seems like he's going to die to the poison as they're retreating back home. But he ends up having a dream where his father comes to him as a ghost, and this is right after his father dies. So they're very, very close to Ulthuan. I think they're actually back on Ulthuan by this point, but they're further north. And Eltharian's dad says, hey, son, I'm dead. Um, there's this big bad goblin at home, and if you don't stop him, it's gonna be the apocalypse. Literally, everyone's going to die. Also, here's my sword. Bye. And Altharian's fever breaks, he wakes up, and his sword is right there. And to make matters worse, it's not an exaggeration because as Blacktooth is making his way across, the destruction of all of the menhers is causing everything to shake to the point that the mountains are beginning to collapse in some parts of Tori of Res. The land is beginning to churn and anyone who is wise would stop. But we all know that green skins are not necessarily wise, a force of destruction, one could argue. And um, 
all of Ulthwin is beginning to respond by about the time that we hit the main siege. Now, um, it's worth saying that the city is largely destroyed by this time, by the time that um, Eltharion arrives. Um, but it's also worth saying that there is a clear question as to where is, for example, the lore master of Hoeth. Where is the other important elves? They have methods of moving across great distances in a very short period of time. And I think that the answer is quite clear because we need an answer. You, they would be responding by this point. Mm -hmm. And the answer, again, has to be what is happening with Blacktooth. He has done something. The magic has been disrupted. The normal routes that they would hear have become clouded in that the great rising of Azir that would come from all of the breakings is stopping them from being able to see the future correctly, which means the lore masters can no longer scry the heaven and say that's where the danger is because of the sudden onrush of magic. Whoops, bash my mic there. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of seeing the future, what they're uh, doing is seeing that something's going wrong. What is it? And they begin to feel those portents rising. The horde is making its way across the coast as they're going, oh, no, something's going on. And by the time it crashes into the city and starts raising it, towers collapsing, the true depth, of the trouble they're in becomes clear as all of Althuin begins to shake and panic rises everywhere. Fortunately, though, Eltharion, the good old Grim Warder of Toryavret to be, has arrived. Yeah, and hilariously, um, you may have noticed by the what we're kind of talking about, but Grom, I'm so ready. Yeah. Grom just doesn't up. matter at this point. <laughs> like Grom, he's still technically leading the wall, but Blacktooth has been getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and he's running on a yeah. wyvern at this point. Uh, because when they arrived in Oathwan, one of the ships, a single wyvern survived the trip, and it started going crazy and That's killing fun. greenskins. And old Blacktooth looked at it, and it immediately was like, "Oh, sorry." And Blacktooth uses it as his mount for the rest of the mm -hmm. Old One invasion. But Blacktooth starts getting horrifically strong. Yes, one energy, the yeah, that. yeah, one energy messes with a lot of shit. Yeah, and, and it could certainly make it very difficult for the elves to understand what's happening, at least enough for the lightning attack from the wolf riders, because it was super fast. Yeah, and that's and that's and there's some beautiful artwork of kind of like the big siege of Tori Ifres, where you have like a yeah. giant army of wolf riders crashing into elf spearmen. It's a really classic piece of art. It's awesome. Um, but um uh like Andy said, the, the, a lot of the really famous elf characters would not have realized a what's going on, and even if they're trying to figure out what's going on and respond, some of them have the means to travel instantaneously or near instantaneously across Old One, but most of them don't. Hmm. And even if they get there, they have no fucking idea what's going on. They might show up at a waystone and go, oh, there's a waystone going hair, uh, her crazy, show up, and it's already been destroyed, and there's barely any green skins left. Yeah. And going, fuck, I'm in the wrong place. And it's just this game of cat and mouse where they can't figure out where the fuck Grom is. Yeah, and I think that that's what you've got to understand. It's very easy with us, with our God view of reading the writing and going, so Grom arrives, three days later, they besiege Tori of Res, Tori of Res falls it's mm. got goblins all the way through it eltharian arrives where the fuck is everybody else it's very easy to say that but when you then put yourself in the shoes of these characters say for example you're a, a lore master whose response who's great i don't know love is checking all the stones and making sure they're doing what they're meant to do he senses that something's going wrong he goes there's something going wrong well, this isn't good. What is it? He starts casting spells. A day later, he thinks he's figured it out. He doesn't think that Ulthuin is falling because that's impossible. Yeah. And then he goes to someone else and says, there's definitely something up here. Elves politic. No, you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. It's right here. Elves politic all the time. No, no, you're wrong. Let's argue about it. The next day, oh, shit, it's really gone wrong. We need to get over there. Let's call Loremaster Blah, who can get us over there. They all go through. They arrive at the stone. What the fuck? It's gone. There's dung everywhere. What the hell is going on here? By the mm. time they hit day three, they've reached the point that they realize there's been a massive invasion. It's just completely gone. They're confused. They start sending word back. And by the time that everything is set up and they're ready to respond, the threat's already gone. Yeah. So uh, Grom is successful in sacking Tori of Res. Uh, like he, he has fucks it up right proper. Um, his army, they smashed at the walls. Blacktooth is incredibly powerful at this point. None of the elf mm -hmm. wizards can stop him. He's obliterating people. Uh, he's fists of gorking through the walls and foot of gorking on top of people. And he is cackling because he is so drunk with power. Yep. And he full on overwhelms slash corrupts 
the waist on a tour of your breast, which is a big one. It is a fucking hugely important waist on. Now, um, I think it's worth adding an extra detail here for those of you who might not know your high elf lore very much. This stone is probably also housing thousands of elven souls. Mm. Elven souls that have not been slipped off to she who thirsts, the chaos god of excess, Slanesh. These are souls that have been trapped up um, by the elves so they do not move on, and they're often held in these great waystones. And these souls are now gone forever. Yeah, this is... Easily one Bad. of the great, yeah. This is like one of the greatest really? tragedies the elves will suffer like, until the end times. I mean, um, it's, it's it's horrific. It's as bad as the cataclysm for some of them because it's not just that they're losing their family members and their ancestors; they're losing them to the depredations of the ruinous powers. The demons are feasting around this. Now, this immediately will bring up a question. Does that mean that this was caused by the ruinous powers? Is this chaos? No! Orcs don't need chaos to do yeah. this. It, they are, in many specs, chaos small C, not big C. This isn't chaos. Do, does chaos benefit? Yes. Sean? But is this chaos? Doesn't need to be. Yes. This is that's, that's why the elves don't have any major forts in the east. Uh, and it's yes. really just cities that are built up around the most important waystones as places for everyone to retreat to because they just didn't think it was possible. Yeah. Um, and to um, their credit, it only happens once in like a meaningful way. And it's Grum. Like there, mm -hmm. there are some other forces that occasionally make their way through, but they're never big enough to be a huge threat. And they usually die immediately. Yep. Um, yep. So, yeah. So the elves, Tori of rest, uh, Grom is laughing it up. He's having a great time. His army is <laughs> crashing over the city. And then all of a sudden the world starts to, go crazy the skies start to go black lightning starts flashing everywhere lightning of all colors as well don't just think of this as white there's a oh, lightning yeah, no. of all colors of the rainbow because magic is going proper wild yeah. to the point that if you've got the old um, storm of magic book that's what's happening here the end times hmm. have arrived in tori of rest and it hasn't been because of chaos it's because of elven arrogance and greenskins yep and grom to his credit Kind of, and all the green skins that are not black tooth, they genuinely start to look around and go, Whoa, this is a little <laughs> scary. <laughs> what the fuck's going on, guys? And old black tooth is up flying above the city and he's done it. He is overwhelmed slash broken the last waystone and he is casting a, he's building up power and he is about to ascend to something. But mm. he hears the cackling of gods and he is drunk. And in this split moment, the hero arrives. And Altharian the Grim, on Stormwing, being the ultimate badass he is, comes zipping down from the sun so Blacktooth doesn't see him and decapitates him with one swing. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And Blacktooth dies. But if you know anything about magic, is that the most dangerous form of magic is miscasts functionally. Which, if you have a wizard who's building up an apocalypse level of magic, and then he suddenly dies, that magic has got to go somewhere. And it's going to go everywhere. <laughs> and uh, basically, all hell breaks loose. Um, like, if the Greenskins were a little scared before, now they freak the fuck out because magic starts going haywire. It's it's basically like the realm of chaos has come to Yvres. Yeah, there's also a, a further potential interpretation here as well. Um, and that's just down to basic greenskin psychology. When you take out the war boss, the horde splits. And I think it speaks to what has happened in the journey between the Empire over to Althuin. The war boss is no longer really Grom the Paunch. Grom the Paunch has, in many respects, taken a back seat to the incredibly powerful prophet, if you wish to say, of Gork and Mork, who is going to use high elven arrogance and their magic to potentially wipe out all elves in Ulthuin. There's, there's this clear idea that this is what's on the way. Eltharian saves the day, but the day is not going to end peacefully. Yeah, and what's interesting is taking a moment to examine... <laughs> he lost his head anyway. Yeah, yeah he, he did. did. <laughs> he one, did, Gary. <laughs> so what's interesting is examining Blacktooth, and there are a lot of theories um, within the fan community and even kind of in some of the army books about who exactly Blacktooth was listening to and who was kind of egging him on. Because in some interpretations, it's just Gork and Mork having a great time 
because destruction is their bread and butter. It is what they love and exult in. And stomping, stomping the pointy ears on Ulthuan so hard that the island gets stomped, that's a riotous good time from a green skin perspective. Absolutely is. Uh, but there are also theories that the Dark Gods may have been manipulating some acts behind the scenes. We even had the super chat from Mandatis earlier asking if maybe Bellacor was somehow involved and whispering things. Bellacor, something that's been coming up more and more and more, whether you're watching Lawhammer or playing Vermintide, is that Bellacor has a horrific, or if you've played Total War Warhammer, this happens as well. Bellacor has an incredible gift at impersonating gods. He's very very good at it so if i were to give an interpretation of this my first interpretation would be i am loath to make one of the most successful was be anything other than that because mm. you don't want to undermine an entire species by saying that that is actually because of the manipulation of someone else mustache twirl but this is the Warhammer world, and we have a shifting of power. I think I am quite happy to say something like this occurred. Along comes Grom, and Grom, being Grom, does everything that Grom did. Grom sits in his big fat ass, having successfully done everything, and goblins his wa to an end. His wa is coming to an end now. He is <laughs> about to fragment. He has done everything he needs to do. This is a wa unlike any other goblin wa, and arguably unlike any other wa, um, in that it has successfully wiped out the dwarven kingdoms almost entirely, except for their main holds, because they, they just buckled up and they hid. That has wiped out the empire effectively, and if it wished, will take it. All it needs to do is keep on pushing for a few years. The empire is going to fall. If Grom decides to attack Altdorf, Altdorf is screwed. Yep. But we have ourselves divine intervention, and the divine intervention then leads them towards the sea and the eradication of the vast majority of Grom's successes. Grom's successes are belittled and made worse. And that I'm quite happy being a story that's not Grom's. Particularly because when we arrive at Althuin, Grom no longer, as was quite clearly made clear, no longer is really in control. It is now the shaman. And I'm quite happy to say that the shaman is under the influence of someone else. I think there's a potential story that's interesting. And that story is ultimately trying to bring down the great network of Orgums around the world that siphons magic. That's what he was trying to do. Destroy Ulthuin, and that vortex is gone. And we do know that there is one entity above almost all else who wants that. And that was an entity that had absolute, complete authority, control, and power in the material realm that was even, even terrifying the Dark Gods themselves, Bellacor. And that shaman, mm. that shaman drifts right by where Bellacor probably is. The chance that it's Bellacor is very high. I think it makes sense. Is it one that I would personally choose? I think that's up for debate. But I think that if you are looking for someone to be behind it, it's a far better option than the far more mercurial powers of chaos who rarely manipulate in this sort of way, particularly greenskins that are by their very nature exceedingly difficult to manipulate. But manipulating just one at the right point, it's very Bellacor. Yeah, and the thing is, there's also a cleverness to it. If it was Bellacor, which I think is a much stronger option than it being like Zinch or one of the actual Chaos yeah, Gods, yeah. because Bellacor very cleverly shapes it in a way that it's greenskin friendly. Because the thing about Gork and Mork is that they'd be totally great with this punch up. A whole new mm -hmm. land to go stomp on and like elves, like the pointy and ears I who usually are so annoying and avoid them. The fact that and I'll go further. Spores are now in Ulthuin. Yeah, yeah, which weirdly they never do anything with, but they should have. Of course they don't. Get me shoot. Lore accurately, Greenskin should have been a problem in Yvres from that point forward. Like an, mm. a never ending problem for them. Um, mm. They don't do anything with that, but that's stupid because that's how Greenskins work. But anyway, so, but like Gork and Mork would have been totally in favor of this. And hey, more magic in the world? That means they get to do more wah. They get to do more punchy stuff. Maybe they can even manifest themselves if they want right. to. But, um, Black Tooth, he does act oddly, I will say. Yeah. For a for a greenskin shaman, he gets bizarrely direct. And this is the, to my knowledge, this is the only time we see a shaman co-opt a wall from a war boss. Yeah. Um bring up Mandatis oh, there. Nice. 
Painting Dowie Hammerers while listening to Arcs being drunk and Elgi suffering from their own arrogance is most fitting. Totally agree. <laughs> of course, so, the doors will be sitting there going, ah, oh, they're getting what they deserve. Ah. <laughs> so I'm now going to take it further. Okay, so I'm now going to go beyond simply stating that it could be this and start stating that it's more likely that it is. And, oh, before I do that, I'll just pick up a still loading there. Cheers! Is Grom a mutant or does he have a tumour? As we've discussed already, he has troll flesh held inside his belly, which is constantly regenerating and grow growing. I mean, I mean, you don't need to. It's 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 trolls. Yeah, it's, trolls. It's, it's not like yeah. a class. It's not a chaos mutation. It's just he ate a Yeah, tumor. yeah, quite. He's got, he, he's, but, but he does mutate now, which is a bit, I mean, regenerate now, which is a bit weird, but. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> let's get past that. So. Orcs don't use magic. Now, this is a not terribly controversial claim. Why magic is magic, obviously, but it's stuff they generate themselves. Yes. And they don't use the winds of magic as everybody else understands them. So what the fuck was Blacktooth doing dragging magic out of these stones? Not his magic, not his ability, not something he can do. It proves pretty much that he is no longer a simple orc shaman. He has gone beyond gathering all the wah magic and then summoning up his gods in divine intervention. That's loosely how ma wah magic works. The more orcs there are, the more orcs can be intervened upon by their gods as the shamans try to channel all this energy, often fail, their heads explode, but they give it a good go. They bring it down, they stomp on stuff, he is not using the right sort of magic, which strongly suggests he is either a genius and has figured out how to get past all of these things, or Blacktooth is something quite different, or possibly old Blacktooth isn't even an orc. Now that is a controversial claim to end up. That is a controversial claim. <laughs> <laughs> because that would answer what he was doing. Hey, it was Bellacor all along. That would be one answer. It was the changeling. It was something else attempting to manipulate the horde in its own direction. It arrives and it whispers. Rather than say that the orcs are just being manipulated, I'd much prefer that Blacktooth himself wasn't an orc because that answers everything that he does. Everything that he does. There's not a single mm. part of his story that doesn't make sense if it's an agent of a different form because much of what he does is so un-orky. It was clearly written before what orc magic was defined as being was very much pinned in place. But that doesn't matter because they've kept the story. That being the case, we need to answer that story. And that's one way of doing it. Let's put on. Hey, yes, that. Uh, Let's yeah, put Black, on our tinfoil hats. Yeah, Black, uh, <laughs> laughing God, I actually really <laughs> like this theory potentially of Black Tooth manipulated by Bellicor had Grom's wall wipe out the gnomes for a specific reason, maybe Olgu related. If you had a gnome character and you're running like a campaign or the enemy within or something, that could be a really fun thing to come up against is that Grom's discovery of the gnomes was not an accident. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I would very much support that. If we ever do a gnome stream, there's an entire story I could tell regarding there because there are, were originally 666 gnome clans and each one of them had a purpose for the end times and they're not there. Yeah, so uh, with all of that in mind, this story or this stream is technically about Grom. So it is. swiveling the camera away from whatever the fuck Blacktooth is <laughs> back over to Grom, Grom sees all this happen. He sees this Uber spell get cast and he sees Blacktooth get killed and mm -hmm. his army breaks. They see this green skin swelling with orky awesome power and then he dies and they go, oh, fuck. And they all start to scatter and run, especially because magic going haywire and everything's very scary. There is a hilarious quote about Grom at this moment where Grom sitting on his chariot, which he has built for like the fifth or sixth time after arriving <laughs> in Old One, looks around <laughs> at his wall and he briefly considers attempting to rally his army together and then he looks up at what the fuck's going on at uh, the 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 spire of Tor Yivres where the Minhir stone is inside of it going batshit crazy and he goes yeah fuck this and he turns his chariot around and leaves it's implied maybe he could have rallied his army together and yeah. flattened the city he could have brought on the apocalypse but in that moment Grom <laughs> decides nope I'm done and he leaves and in some versions of the story, he's never seen again. Um, but we're going to explore a couple little things about that. So in older lore, um, there is an explicit end to Grom. 
uh, which uh, there are the version that I'm familiar with is that Grom does successfully get to the coast and he does successfully leave and he gets back to the Badlands, but he's pursued. And Eltharion the Grim, after saving the day, uh, which does horrible things to him emotionally and mentally, uh, goes after Grom, and there's a big war in the Badlands, which ends with Eltharion finally tracking Grom down. They fight, and Eltharion wins, and he kills Grom. And there's an iconic scene about the way he kills Grom is he literally chops him up piece by piece and feeds each piece into a fire to make sure it burns, to make absolutely fucking sure Grom dies. And it's implied he does this while Grom is still alive. So it's like awful and agonizing and super fucking torturous and dark. Um, That is the older version of the story. Um, And that's the end of Grom. Grom the Ponch finally dies. Um, There is, there are new versions of the story uh, in later editions that decide to keep Grom alive. um, Mm -hmm. Most likely because they were considering bringing him back for some kind of story. Um, which is that, but of course, end times fucked a lot of these prophecy type things up. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah. So in that version of the story, the same thing happens. Grom makes it to the coast. He escapes. Eltharion pursues him. But what happens in that story instead is when Eltharion arrives in the Badlands and he starts killing Greenskins, he runs into a problem, which is that the more Greenskins they kill, the more other Greenskins hear about this great fight against this pointy ear get, and they all start swarming in. So he has to keep fighting more and more and more. And he just can't find Grom. He just doesn't know where he is. And Grom won't come out to fight him. So eventually him and the elves have to pack up and leave. Much to Eltharion's bitter, bitter hatred. Which go- plays into why he he's a very dark character in the later editions. He is. Um, and I, I prefer that story in general. Because anything that makes Eltharion grimmer is a good thing. Yeah, and in those versions, there is a very explicit prophecy that basically states that Grom is still alive somewhere, and that and it, then it skips to the modern timeline, so like the 2510s, 2520s, and that rumors say that Grom has gotten off his fat ass, for finally, and he's coming back. And the goblins are starting to whisper that Grom has been sighted in the southern Badlands, maybe around Misty Mountain, and that the big end is coming. And there's a lot of allusions to him about to return. And then he just doesn't. <laughs> doesn't. And it's a real shame because uh, I really like the idea of effectively the immortal goblin. Um, and Because it's just a fun story. This goblin yeah. is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the troll yeah. within good him old, is regenerating. That elf Altharian. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, totally. Um, and I really like that story, and I really like the idea that we could have yet another confrontation between Eltharion and Grom. But if we sum it all up, because we're definitely at that point where we're looking at the whole of Grom now and summoning up so we can answer all of our questions. Yep. Um, Grom was, without much of an argument, the most successful goblin warlord that has ever walked the Warhammer world that we are aware of. He successfully defeated the vast majority of the World Edge Mountains into the Borderlands, into the Empire, was not defeated in any significant battle ever, moves over to Ulthuin with a massively depleted force, and nevertheless takes out an entire kingdom of elves by himself. Obviously, there's our shaman kicking along at the edge, but that's not the fighting. The actual fighting, for all we've sort of sidelined Grom at the end, it's still being led by Grom. He is the tactician here. He is the one mm. that is pushing them forward. Yeah, it's, Yvres, it's hurting. Blacktooth would have never gotten to Yvres without Grom. Like, no, Grom, no, never. Grom wins all the fights against the elves. Yeah. Tor Yvres falls, is crushed, the walls go down, goblins are in all the streets when Elfarian eventually arrives. The destruction of Blacktooth and the, dis- the culmination of Blacktooth's plan is enough for Grom to say I'm done and I would like to think that I don't know uh, when Can everything you... has uh, my room is getting repaired just now so I can't set everything up the way I want to I'm getting on top of that in a few I don't know whenever Lindsay gets around to eventually it. so yeah. I will be on that one eventually no, it'll be worth it, the wait guys just chill yeah <laughs> totally I, I, I'm desperate to go on that by the way I'm uh, this computer's crashed me like three times between as well uh so where was I yes yeah, so Grom then retreats, and I like to think that if we are to look at this character, what we have is more than just a fat goblin. 
mm. more than just the caricature that he becomes where, oh, he's fat, so he must be eating a lot. No, not really. He's filled with troll flesh. He's regenerating. He's different. We have a goblin who's clearly somewhat close to a genius, who has a tactical genius and has basically driven his greenskins to success after success after success. And he's also martially exceedingly capable. Now, admittedly, that's backed up by the fact he's nigh on immortal under certain circumstances, but that is something that he uses to his advantage as well. I like to think that by the time that he reaches Ulthuin and the great battle goes down and everything occurs, he realizes he's been used. Mm. And that, that is why he stops. Yeah. Because ultimately, no. And then he goes back home and he will rise again once he gets over that particular issue. And I think that once you add a goblin psychology on top of it all, I think that would make for a really compelling and interesting story. Aleph, would you say Grom is more Morky or more Gorky in the grand scheme of things? Yes. Yeah, the, yeah, the technical answer would be yes, uh, but I would say Grom, and the reason he's probably so ridiculous is he's very well balanced between Gork and Mork, uh, where like, you know, obviously there's the joke that they're twins and they're interchangeable, which is true, but you know, there are slight deviations between them where, you know, Gork one's is cunning the, and brutal, one's yeah. brutal and cunning. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, it's like, okay, there's the idea that Gork is more of the like punchy orky side of things and Mork is more of the cunning Gabo side of things. But Grom used both sides very, very intertwined. Um, he's not like later Goblin characters who we'll talk ho hopefully about in later streams uh, who are much more Morky in the way they handle mm. things. Though Grom does, Grom does pave the way for them. Um, Grom set up the idea that you could have powerful goblin war yeah. bosses which a certain gobbo that a lot of people very dearly love takes advantage of later on mm. uh mm. Let's see yeah, oh. <laughs> so we have the questions on can nope. Andy start warhammer 3 with gelt if you if you if you give him a 500 hundred dollar tip on the next lorebeard stream <laughs> he'll do it <laughs> oh, oi oi <laughs> fuck me <laughs> I'll be doomed. <laughs> has to be only in a single one, not cumulative. It has to be a single drop. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, I feel sick. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I love. Uh, okay, I love going the point. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of just awesome story threads there. That if you're ever mm. out there exploring your own stories, feel free to explore. Like the, I, I agree mm. with Andy very much that the idea of Grom giving up at the end. There's a really subtle amount of ideas there of that's a very weird thing for him to do really unless, weird yeah unless upon seeing everything that happened with black tooth he realized something and was like wait i don't like this <laughs> like and, i got used and he's definitely the sort of goblin who's clever and is willing to sit down and sit it out as we have seen him multiple times in the past i mean he's pretty much sits in his ass and not only sits in his ass in the great forest for some time effectively ruling from the great forest for a, a few months before moving on uh he's definitely the sort to um think it out in a way that no orc ever would the orc would just keep on fighting and if um, his uh, shaman was doing something stupid, he'd probably just kill the shaman. Mm -hmm. um, but, but this is a goblin and a goblin's roots. And I fear that there's uh, a lack of detail for explaining it all. But equally, I love the fact that there's lots of answers that you can easily spin out of the existing lore that makes it all make nice, clean sense. Yeah, especially because if Grom ever came back, the idea that he has spent 100 years obsessively consulting shamans and other people to figure out who manipulated him so he could get mm. back at them um, on top of maybe not necessarily trusting shamans very much. Oh, yeah. Point, he would be a very interesting character when he came back, um, especially because if he led his war against who was actually responsible, could be a very interesting potential ally in the end times that people would not necessarily want to rely on, but have to. And that's the sort of really awesome stories you want to have when you're heading towards an end time scenario. You want your end time scenario to be filled with complicated moral choices. When you are told that one of your best potential allies is, I say, the one that they chose, Nagash. Or if you're a green skin or something else, that's when it all becomes a bit more interesting. Yep. Uh, Gary, why does Grom start where he starts in Total War? Uh, so, okay, they, they slapped him into uh, Massive Oracle, and the reason he's there is... It massive was, Oracle? Yes. Interesting. 
The reason they put him there was it was the closest place they could give him a big bad greenskin settlement to Ulthuan without putting him in Ulthuan because they tried running him in Ulthuan for a while. And the problem was all the elves would just buddy up and overwhelm him too quickly and it just killed him. So to try and make his AI more reliable and to give him a more interesting campaign. Uh, and so you could experience a full invasion of Ulthuan. They put you as close as they could to Ulthuan while still having him in a greenskin focused fortress. I'd have probably popped in the Badlands. Yeah, he was there as well originally, but they have so many other green skins in the Badlands, they wanted to try yeah. and make something a little, that makes sense. A little that makes sense. Uh, Grom is cool and impressive, but I gotta say I still like Scarstink more. Not as powerful and mighty as Grom, but I still love his guile and well in this. Yes, I would fun. love to do a stream on Scarstink at some point. He is a yes. fascinating fucking green skin. Uh, yeah, because agreed. as far as like smart goes, no other green skin fucking compares to Scarstink. Like, Scarstink's a fucking philosopher. Not just a smart <laughs> war boss. Um, but yes, uh, Scarsnake is amazing. But Gr Grom's different. Um, it's it's a different expression of goblin-ness. <laughs> Grom with the steel chair! Yeah. Um, yeah, especially, Thanks, laughing yeah, man, that would have been such a cool story for the end times as well. Just the <laughs> idea of like some big bad chaos thing whether the changeling or Bellacor or someone, someone really clever ends up having to deal with a fucking goblin and the incredulousness of them being like, you're a goblin and him being like, yeah, but I figured you out. <laughs> like, could you yeah. imagine if the changeling had gotten figured out by Grom of all people? <laughs> wow. That's the sort of stories you want to tell though, because ultimately if it's the end times, it should be everyone versus chaos. Like, okay. Just to pay everyone. Just to paint a scene for everyone in their head, imagine they're having the Council of Incarnates, right? Like Archeons come down, all the all the good guys have teamed up. So you got Nagash and Grimgore and all these other guys together who all hate each other, but they're forced to work together. Grom walks in the room, waddles into the room, and the first thing he does is turn around and kill someone that everyone's like, the fuck, it's our ally. And then it's revealed to be the changeling, but Grom figured it out. That would have been fucking peak fiction right there. <laughs> Yeah, and how fun upset in there. the changeling would be that of all the things that got him, it was a goblin. Mm. That would have been yeah, perfect. A story in that, yeah, totally. Yeah. Anyway, so, what sort of questions do we have this week? So, uh, how long could Grom go without swallowing new food? Oh, uh, or water, or before he dies? Actually, before we go, I've got a couple of things I'd like to say. Number one, if you want to get your questions up, make sure you do pop over to Lore Master Sotek's Discord channel where he has a stream of. He has an entire channel, I think, put aside yeah, for all yeah, the questions. We, yeah, we do a okay. thread for everyone. We do a thread there, so you can just dump in there and ask questions beforehand. Obviously, that's only ones that are submitted before the stream begins, and mm. uh, we'll take them there. Uh, beyond that, if you are not already subscribed right now, why the hell are you not subscribed to Sotech's channel? Do. Just press subscribe. Like please button, do. Please. We appreciate and it. If, and if you are on YouTube, yeah, do press like. That's lovely. And don't forget that our streams go out live on my channel over on Lawhammer as well every other week. So if you'd like to keep up with that, go check out my uh, Twitch channel and, of course, my YouTube channel. Subscribe over there and you will definitely keep up with everything we're doing as Grari drops in another quick one there. What would Warzag think of Grom? Uh, Warzag is the big prophet of Gork and Mork, so he would yeah. love Grom. He would love yeah. Grom. Um, so I, I like to think because of War Warzag, that uh, Blacktooth definitely isn't what he claims to be because of the existence of Warzag, and I think that Grom would be loved by him, yes. Yeah, if it, though it, what would be hilarious is Grom would probably be very mistrusting of Warzag. Grom's come back as a Stormcast called the Punchcast. <laughs> <laughs> Grom, the Stormcast Eternal. Um, maybe that's maybe that should be our next podcast, the Punchcast. Because I'm punch definitely cast. putting on weight. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, yeah, <laughs> most people don't know, but they modeled Grom's gut in game after my own. It's true. Mm. Uh, but, uh, anyway, so uh how long could Grom go without eating or drinking before he dies? And uh we kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'm glad you brought it up. Honestly, Grom probably doesn't have to eat. Um, yeah, I think all he'd need is liquid. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not saying he wouldn't feel hungry and his continuing flatulence wouldn't occur, but I'm pretty convinced that going down the Grom must eat route is a weak understanding of the situation he's currently dealing with. Yeah, like Total War leans really heavily into the concept of, oh, Grom is fat, so he must eat a lot. But like, he probably doesn't actually, like he might, it, it's certainly possible because like, it's not clear if when he finally overcomes the troll meat, whether he fully digests it or whether it's just that he is taking the upper hand and that troll meat is just there for the rest of eternity with him constantly digesting it. Um, 
I want to bring this one up, James, because you are correct. Discord yeah. questions don't get answered all the time because of the lack of time. That's absolutely correct. If you do put a question over there, we won't necessarily get to it, but we do answer all the questions that are brought up as super chat, fair, and we, we do try. Yeah, we do explicitly skip questions that have been answered in the stream. So if you're like, well, yeah, my absolutely. question wasn't called out, hopefully it was because we answered it. Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, I would say that Grum probably only needs to drink, and even then, I don't know if he necessarily needs to. Um, but uh, I would say that he probably doesn't actually need to eat that much because they did go very culinary themed. I do love Gom's cauldron, like, but if anything, Grum would probably eat for flavor, not necessity. Hey, Ryan, when Eltharian pursued Grom after his escape, do you think Grom refused to meet Eltharian because he was actually afraid of him, or he just could not care less at the time? Thanks, guys. Little uh, both. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that it depends entirely on what Grom's current thought process is. If Grom is off being another warlord and desperate to go and chop things down, I imagine he wouldn't care less and would just go, eh, it's that elf, I'll chop it down as the next elf in my path. If Grom has a greater purpose, as in trying to figure out what Blacktooth was up to or something, Elfarian is the least interesting thing in his path. He will not care if there's an elf kicking out over there. He's got other shit to do, and Grom will fuck off on his chariot that's his 94th one or whatever, and piss off to do a different job. Um, I would say that the answer there lies more in what who, what happened. We don't have an official answer, but we can certainly build our own stories. And if you're building your own story for, say, a role-playing game, that is a really interesting question to pose. Yep. Uh, yeah, because Grub, I mean, Grub's not really the kind of guy to make a grudge against a particular individual and seek to drag that person down. That's a very orky thing. Yeah. Um, because even if a goblin does have a grudge against a particular character, they usually do like other weird things to get back at them. And Grom, Grom just doesn't care. Like he's not driven like that. Hmm. Uh, theoretically, could another paunch arise from Dawi? Probably not. Um, it was kind of a freak set of circumstances that created Grom. I agree. Um, the perfect balance between the situation and the individual at hand. I mean, theoretically it could, but the odds are so against it. If it was that easy, there'd be loads of them. Yeah, I mean, consider, like, there are greenskins that eat troll, but either they die or they become, like, uh, Gorbat, or, uh, not Gorbat, um, Gorfang Rockgut. Gorfang Rockgut's, one of his titles is the troll eater, because he literally eats trolls, but his digestion has gotten, is strong enough that he just digests them. Yeah. Um, okay. Which is something he brags about, but, like, yeah. th to get that perfect balance where Grom had it is, like, a one in a billion chance. Yeah, totally. Uh, Infiltrator of Troy, Grimgor hates gobbos. Would that apply to Grom? Because Grom isn't a typical gobbo. Yes. Uh, Grimgor hates goblins because they talk too much. And Grom would definitely talk a lot. That is, that's... <laughs> and a standard bear would talk even more. <laughs> yeah. Grimgor <laughs> hates goblins because they're annoying, not for any other reason. So I, I don't think Grom would be an exception to that rule. I agree. Uh, Nighthawk, if you, if Andy or Sotek wanted to make adjustment to Grom and Eltharian's final confrontation, what changes would you make? Uh, I think we already kind of answered that of why Grom left the battle. Yep, and I would like his um, final confrontation to take place um, almost certainly in the end times. That would be my preference. Yeah, especially and... running... We've talked about this before, but running in the end times of Altharian gets a choice of doing what's best for the world and uh, sparing Grom and like putting aside his yeah. grudges to work with Grom, or does he allow his personal hatred to overcome him, which helps chaos in the end? And ultimately, that's what I do. I'd have Eltharian kill Grom, and Grom be the answer to a particular solution. Uh, the probably a provider of a particular solution that never occurs because Eltharian kills him. Yeah, um, yeah. That yeah works we talked about uh, doing a similar thing with like Grom or Malekith. Like that. Absolutely. That should be why the the world fails is because the races of non chaos can't set aside their differences. Yep. Uh, I'm starting up a Grom campaign until World Warhammer Three with the ex Express. Yes. Don't for Andy. <laughs> I approve, Aleph. You rock. Uh, what would a meeting between Skarsnik and Grom look like, Nighthawk? It would probably actually look pretty interesting, I think, because mm. Skarsnik is not above manipulating bosses that he knows are physically stronger than him. That's how he mm -hmm. deals with Gorfang Rockgut. Skarsnik doesn't try to kill him, really. He he purposefully st stokes Gorfang's ego and is like, oh, we should work together. We should be mates. And Skarsnik is very clever about how he handles other greenskin war bosses. And I think he would do something similar to Grom. Um, the more interesting question would be what would happen between Skarsnik and old Blacktooth? Because I think Skarsnik and his shaman Duff Skull would have had some serious issues with Blacktooth. Yeah, agreed. 
let's see. Certain to Sin, do you think Scar Snake is a better king than Grom? Because he's Zogginwell is. All hail the king under the mountain. Uh, he's certainly less successful than Grom. King is an interesting term. Um, yeah. I would argue he's a better king, but he's not a better warlord. I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, and Scar Snake is very unique. Um, like mm. he's the one of the only green skin characters that kind of has a wall that doesn't go anywhere, which means he technically doesn't have a wall, um, which is a whole thing that we'll talk about one day if we ever do a Scar Snake stream. Yep. Uh, if the dwarves in the Empire had allied together to stop Grom, could they have? Most of Grom's sex, uh, success seems to largely come from his enemies handling him with incompetence. No, I disagree. I don't think that's the case. I think that they made many attempts to uh, hold him back. You could argue that the Empire... Um, you could argue that the Empire were responsible for many of his successes in the Empire because of the Emperor, and that in Reichland he was held back. But that's just one grand province amongst many. Um, I think that the real place where you place the success is Grom. Yeah, I would have said if the Empire had answered the dwarfs' yeah. call and they had actually had a united force of the Imperial provinces and the dwarfs at like Blackfire Pass, they probably could have cast Grom back. But it probably Grom would have gone a different direction. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. I don't think they would have killed him or beaten him, really. I think he yeah. would have just altered course and gone down the border princes into like the vaults towards Bretonia and Talia. <laughs> yeah, and um, he he's he's a he's uh he's a wolf rider at heart which means that he believes in guerrilla warfare he will have gone up seen the thing go nope i'll go elsewhere and just gone in a different direction it yeah, i think it's inevitable he would have ended up successfully going to ulth one um yeah. no matter who united to stop him yeah <clears throat> yes that's true so mandatus brings up that uh grom the paunch has black tooth's head and it talks to him in warhammer total war so yes the, i the, did not know that yeah, see so this I is my missing lore is always yes, the, the idea war behind the, uh, ah. the total war campaign for Grom is that a ritual Grom is his ca held on to Black Tooth's head this entire time and like pickled it do. in a jar. And there's a ritual at the start of his campaign where he resurrects old Black Tooth as a head that talks to him, <laughs> tells him what's going on. It's hilarious. It's actually super funny. Um, all right. Uh, uh, let's see. How far could Grom have gotten if he headed towards Cafe? Um, so there's a big reason greenskins don't tend to go that way, and it's because the dark lands are there, and the dark yeah. lands are really fucking boring, and they're really fucking dangerous, and they're really big and hostile to crossing. Getting a wall across the dark lands would be really hard. Yeah, possible. Um, yeah, I yeah. I mean, you, and there's 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 this whole sort like, of horror. I mean, the dark lands. You know, like in, in many respects, I think it would be better to say that he did and he chose not to. In that, when they spread that out from the spine of the world, they they sucked in the direction where there was just more easy conflict. So I think that the answer is that he chose not to. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I think if he had like, if his it, it would have a hilarious alternative thought is if some magical bullshit happened with that storm and his fleet had ended up on the coast of Cathay, he probably would have been a nightmare for Cathay because they have oh, a yeah. there, and he would have just started rallying up tribes again. He would have been a huge pain in the ass for the dragons. I agree with this. A battle between the Knights of Bretonia and Grom's Chariots, Wolf Riders, Boar Riders, and everything else would have been very appropriate. It really would have. And it would have been super fun too. And I think, sadly, that the Bretonians would have been in exactly the same position as the Empire. In oh, the yeah. End. Um, Grom would almost certainly have won. Yeah, he would have um, cast one, and the Bretonians would have pulled back to their castles, closed the doors, and Grom would have got bored and left. And then <laughs> that's exactly what would have happened. So um, Bretonia would not have suffered more than uh, effectively losing all of their crops for a few years before the wah moves on. Yep. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, let's Thanks. see. Uh, does Grom ever interact with Bretonia? No. Uh, we are talking about that. Uh, he never went there. Uh, yeah. Could Grom have a contender for the Avatar of Mork? Uh, Scarsnake. I I actually think Scarsnake would beat Grom as an Avatar of Mork specifically. Grom's better as like almost an Avatar of Gorka Morka to be Gorka honest. Gorka Morka. Um, yeah. Than anything else. Um, Grom would have been like Agreed. the great negotiator <laughs> between the concepts of Gork and Mork. I agree. Um, Completely. Uh, let's see. Uh, Grom versus Greases versus... Oh, we already answered that. Um, what would you have had Grom do in the end times? Uh, we talked about that. Um, yep. uh, that being said, I would... Yeah, because I would have used Eltharian for that, I would not have had Eltharian die against Archon. You could have literally put anybody in that position, and it, it's a fine story. Just pick a good special character, and you can have them die against Archon the Black, and it works fine. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> um, he he goes, uh, first, loved doing fire damage, and was like, nope! <laughs> 
Yep. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think the Chaos Swords would have been one of the best factions to deal with Grom. <laughs> they would have been very scary for him. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Since it's established that orcs would feed goblins troll me for entertainment, is it likely that Grom did this to his prisoners? How would an elf feel about that? I mean, it's torture. Yeah. So not great. Uh, I would I'm, not. I'm sure Grom would absolutely do that to prisoners. Yeah, um, I, that seems really in character. And if uh, you were sitting down writing up, for example, the encampment of Grom and how it is different from other goblin encampments, your first thought would be, what can I do to try and characterize Grom? That would be one way of doing that, showing that uh, he found it almost funny that they were weaker than him and could not survive what he could survive. Yeah. Uh, we it's all about Grom making him look better. Uh, okay, we already answered that. The Elves of Ethaloran were not affected at all by Grom's Wall, other than there was probably more green skins in the old world, which is potentially a problem for them in the long run. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, that's actually one of those good examples of a times that the Elves of Ethaloran probably should have gotten involved, but did their usual bullshit where they decided it wasn't their problem, even though in the long scheme, it would end up being their problem. Because yep. they could have gotten involved. They chose not to. Yep, seems fair. Uh, does Grom have any cool magic items such blessings from Gork or Mork? Uh, his big, yeah, actually, yes. Um, he's got the Grom. axe of Grom, which we have no fucking idea where he got it from, but it's huge. Um, and it, 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 it can chop down just about fucking anything. Um, also, Niblet is genuinely super lucky, seemingly blessed by Mork with luckiness, and that it's it's stated in in universe that Grom is genuinely lucky because of Niblet being near mm -hmm. him. Like, to the extent that his chariot gets blown up by a cannonball, but he was totally fine. Uh, stuff like that. Like, you could argue his chariot was not very lucky because it <laughs> is destroyed on a very regular basis. But Grom himself and Niblet definitely <laughs> always survive. Yep, totally. Um, let's see. Has he eaten many beastmen aside from the Centigore memes? He, I'm sure he fought and ate his fair share of beastmen, especially when the goblins took over the Great Forest. Uh, let's see. Did he, uh, let's see. I think we already answered about how Grom's fleet got to Ulthuan and how that Wa magic was definitely probably involved. Um, yeah. is Grom just the most successfully successful goblin warlord, or is he also the physically most physically powerful? Both. Oh, they're bad, good, bad, both there. Yeah, Grom is the biggest goblin ever. Like, period. There's no one even close. Mm -hmm. Uh, how would orc warlords feel about a goblin leading a Wa? Scarstick and Grom are the only two I've ever heard about. They don't like it. They, I mean, it happens occasionally, but a goblin, if there are orcs involved, they're going to have to deal with orc challengers on a very regular basis. Scarsnake is constantly killing orcs. Grom was constantly killing orcs. They will challenge you on a regular basis. Yep, definitely. Uh, how bad would a theoretical team up of Grom and Scarsnake be? That would be really fucking awful for everybody, not them. Uh, because Scarsnake brings a very different kind of set of tactics to Grom which is that Scarsnick is the, one of the best ambush tacticians in the world, uh, which would be horrible for everybody else. Uh, okay, so there's a joke. So Grom, Grom has all this... WTF? Uh, so, yes, it is very WTF. Grom has a set of ingredients you can get in-game as his mechanic by defeating certain kinds of enemies. And for the Beastman one, there's, uh, there's an ingredient called Centigore Milk. And the quote, which is from Grom himself says sweet boy he was <laughs> all righty then oh so, you know it's, yeah moving on uh moving it's, on swiftly it's fucking hilarious you would probably really laugh at the way they did Grom's mechanic because it's literally like a cooking simulator where you combine different <laughs> weird ingredients to make dishes i'm cooking mama and the Grom oh, voice my. actor has unique dialogue for the different dishes you create and it's fucking hilarious it's just grumpy like oh that looks like he makes these fucking hilarious goofy comments in the background uh, but they they power up grom in different ways anyway it's just silly fun uh let's see how would a warlord like grom, grom keep the wa in line long enough to build a ship of fleets uh he killed anyone that didn't do it it, yeah. it actually is explicitly spelled out that he kills anyone that doesn't agree to do what he tells them to at that time I, which is unique yeah. normally he doesn't care that much but it, when they tell him they don't want to build ships, he genuinely starts killing people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Does Grom sire unique spores? Oh, that's actually kind of an interesting question from Jiggy. Would Grom have sired unique spores so that his spores would have given rise to like unique or fat types of goblins? I think they no. go well for a goblin-themed army. See, now that's super interesting because that's a great um, question. the actual question is, is Grom a mutant? 
And now, if Grom is a mutant and his actual DNA has changed, the answer is probably yes. Mm. But if Grom is not a mutant and it is nothing more than the unique combination of Grom with the troll, then the answer is no. Because his DNA is the same. The spores he drops are the same. They don't change. So I think that's the question you're more interested in asking. And I would personally prefer he wasn't a mutant because that lies a little bit too closely to chaos. And I wouldn't like to diminish the uniqueness of the character or the species by doing that. Yeah, I especially because he just ate like regular troll. It wasn't a chaos troll. Yeah, so like the totally. mutation just wouldn't really make that much sense. Uh, so Ryan Woodall asks, was Grom's Wa unable to find Athel Tamara? Okay, so this is actually a good question for Andy that I'll explain here real quick. Of that, So in Total War, one of the things they did to try and make Eltharion unique is he has a faction mechanic called Athel Tamara, which is uh, you open it up and it's... So Athel Tamara, for those unaware, it's, it's a really messy thing. But in Eltharion's lore, there are some notes about there being a place called Athel Tamara in Ulthuan that is super important to the elves of Tor Yivris, um, to the point that Altharian's dad hung out there a lot, and that's where he even bumped into Prince uh, Erelok of the Wood Elves. Um, and, like, they had some interactions and stuff. Um, so in Total War, they ran with the idea that Atho Tamara is not a forest, which is weird because Atho Tamara literally means it is a forest. That's what the Athol stands for. Um, instead, they ran with the idea that it is a, a cave that is in inside Tori of Rest. So kind of like how the men here or the, the waystone, it was like inside or underground or something. They went with the idea that, oh, well, maybe that's where the settlement is. Um, this ancient settlement, and there's a bunch of like ancient elven buildings, and that's where he keeps prisoners that he interrogates and stuff like that. Of that course. is not what Althal tomorrow probably really is. Althal tomorrow is likely a sacred forest spot somewhere in Yivris that's very important to like the old days when the ever queen was the only ruler of the elves and forests were like very much a core part of their identity it is not what total war portrays it as so the greenskins probably didn't find it because it wasn't really a settlement or it was fairly or well hidden in the forest didn't somewhere. care or just yeah they probably just didn't give a shit they didn't care seems the most obvious one the poor boys what do you think throt could do with a gobble like grom some horrible shit <laughs> <laughs> is the answer uh throt would have i don't even want to think what throt would have done with grom it would have been really scary and really ugly and unclean yeah and very <laughs> unclean yeah um that, yeah so yeah uh a, a, a goblin that can regenerate from damn near anything mm -hmm. oh boy the things throt would have done with him mm. uh all right uh akuma king should grom get diplomatic bonuses with ogres uh, no i don't think so um i don't think grom would get no. along particularly well with ogres um no. like they're, they're fat but that's where the combo ends grom's not that big i mean of a button. I, I, I i you know some ogres would be like well that's a fat goblin that's interesting can i eat him <laughs> yeah uh yeah it, grom the thing is, is Grom, outside of his Total War portrayal, Grom is not super well known for eating a lot. He is fat, but it's because of the way the regeneration affected him, not because he yeah. eats a ton. Um, though, like, you know, when he's lazing about, presumably he's eating when he's just hanging around. Um, but the ogres probably wouldn't be, like, super impressed uh, with his level of eating. They'd, if anything, they'd probably be disappointed to how little he eats despite his size. <laughs> uh Let's see. Uh, how would Grom's Wa have affected the local Beastman tribes? Would they have been a big problem for the recovering areas after Grom left from Grey Fate? Actually, almost the opposite. An absolute fucking nightmare for them because the goblins would have just swarmed through and killed everything in their path, including the Beastmen, uh, meaning that the Beastmen either A, fled or were destroyed. Were they primed to take over? You know, in some places there would have been a power vacuum, but so many Beastmen would have died that that power vacuum isn't as massive as you might first think. The, the ones that survived would have been in a relatively good place, I suppose, but it's probably not going to be a good 50 years to maybe as much as 100 years before they've swelled back to numbers that are a proper threat. Yeah. I would argue that Grom is the great answer to the uh, great war against chaos and all the awfulness that was left in the forests um, and that Grom swept through and killed tons of it. Yeah, there's actually probably an interesting idea in that for a lot of communities that survived the Greenskins, the forest may have been like relatively peaceful for a while yeah. after that because the Beastmen and the, uh, the leftover Greenskins would have been fighting each other for a really long time. 
um, before they, they they finally reached an equilibrium and started attacking all the Empire stuff again. Uh, yeah, there was probably a good 50 years that were a little weird from the Empire perspective. Yeah, I mean, where, where Grom didn't reach, for example, the north of Ostland and all that, the forests around there are probably still pretty freaking grim. With yeah, the men. Forest of Shadows still super um, fucking nasty. Because it, 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 it did not deal with Grom. Um, where uh, the Drakvald will be a massive mix of all of the above. Yep. Uh, Great Fate, since Grom was made by GW when the satirist nature was particularly strong, what aspect of British life slash which member of parliament was Grom's was satirizing, do you think? I don't know if no. that was what inspired him. No, neither do I, actually. I think um, Grom is a creation of Rick. Uh, Rick Priestley, I think. Um, I think. Uh, but I need to check on that one. Yeah, if anything, um, I would say, funny enough, the 40k setting during that era had a lot more direct satirical ties than fantasy yeah, tended to. Definitely. Uh, it was much more the roleplay side that had the strong satirical edge on those. Um, I can't think of one that it necessarily applies to. Uh, let's see. What's the connection? Uh, Jiggy, what's the connection with Grom and the Mermidian Temple in Bogenhofen? This is disappointing because I think I wrote that section. Um, I'm uh, not sure is my I answer. Want, I think they may just have a note about how the Mermidians may have had to help defend Bogenhofen against Grom as that he kind of swarmed around it. Because um, I do not have anything coming to mind. I'll, I'll go ahead and go to the next question while you're doing that. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go check. Uh, I've, Grom got the, more, I've got the manuscript here, so yeah, I can would, check it. Grom be more Gorky or Morky? We already answered that. He's a, actually a very well-balanced... He's probably one of the most well-balanced uh, Gork or Mork characters next to, like, Gorfang Rockgut. Uh, Grom's campaign was partially about going around destroying Waystones and his big quest to Ulthuan. Definitely seen Chaos involved. Uh, okay, we already answered about this, who, like, who may have been responsible behind it. Uh, why would the orc gods have allowed Grom to be manipulated? Well, you have to remember Gork and Mork don't care as long as it's a punch-up and it's fun. I haven't reached it first, but just to, to confirm, it's uh, 2420 when Bogenhafen is sacked by Grom. Oh, bummer uh, for them. <laughs> yeah, them. I'm busy working my way down through the bit. Temple of Media, here we go. Does it say anything about Grom here? I'll, you go carry on. Uh, the people it. must know, Grom versus Greasis, who wins? Uh, Greasis by nobody. I'm going to sell this for everyone watching right now. Nobody and the entire fucking setting, except for the Great Maw itself, can out eat Greasis. I don't care how big it is. Kraken Rock the Black, I think, would lose an eating contest to Greasis. That's how fucking oh, there we go. loaded Greasis is. Okay, so uh, just so I can, I'll just read it out. Most visitors to Bergenhafen are surprised to find a Templar to Myrmidia. As the goddess's worship is not widespread in the empire, this small colonnaded structure was founded some 80 years ago after the town survived the onslaught of the famous goblin warboss Grom the Paunch. The victory was largely attributed to Captain Inga von Sternberg, a Mermidian trained officer who dedicated every battle he fought to the goddess. Just over a decade after the Greenskin hordes had moved on, the Templar Mermidia was completed to celebrate the goddess's part in Bergenhafen's deliverance. So, that's it, really. Okay. Oh so no, they, they uh, there's a nice bit there about the... Oh, the priest is interesting. I've forgotten about that. Oh, I've forgotten I'd written that. Oh man. Oh, there's a nice little <laughs> bit I'm gonna steal and put into my own campaign. I've just remembered something. Ooh. Uh, hey, good. Uh, hey, good job, whoever asked that question. Uh, who was that? A uh, Jiggy. Good job, Jiggy. Uh let's see. Uh Malisar, do you think if Grom worked out he could become chiseled or was he stuck with the beer gut forever? I I think he's perma perma beer gut. I yeah, indeed. Uh, and I think it's also quite likely that if you want to go down a Grom survives, he might have survived and be almost immobile come the uh, final times. Um, he may not be able to move because of what's occurred to him. Yep. Uh, let's see. Bishop of Cheddar. Uh, we already answered that. Um, AB Backstream. Did Grom ever meet Wurzak or Grimgord? No. Um, although Gr uh, are Altharian special units in Total War real and were they because of Grom? So, uh, so uh, his units, which are all the the mist walkers of Yivres, are based on real notes, either in the Black Library books or the uniforms and heraldry book at the High Elves, or like the Army book. They are all loosely based on or taken from actual units that are mentioned. Um, they weren't like full on playable units, um, but the vast majority of them, though not necessarily all of them, were taken from direct sources. Um, but the most, I mean, the most exotic one is the Knights of Tor Yivres, which are the unit of all griffin writers which is super badass and awesome <laughs> um, yeah Cr crap yeah, it, wouldn't want to be in the receiving end of that charge it's, uh, it's six <laughs> griffin writers uh it's pretty impressive <laughs> but uh yeah no they're they're based on like little lore tidbits 
Um, and just to show, like, and granted, a lot of those units you can't get until you, like, fully restore Tori of Rest. So, like, a lot of them are units that are more, like, in the ancient past or stuff like that that you bring back. Um, all right. Uh, oh, we're coming up to time, so yeah, any uh, last quick fire ones? Yes. Uh, okay, so the thing about Wurzang and Grimgor, they were probably alive during Grom's Rampage, but just didn't bump into them. Um, Warzag was not the Warzag we know if he was alive yet, and Grimgor was at that point still over in the Darklands or the Mountains of Morn. Uh, the last couple questions. Um, if Grom would have managed to disrupt the Vortex, would the Greenskins have become stronger? No, the world would have blown up and died. Um, I mean, that's, that's extreme, but it would have been bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, Greenskins <laughs> don't really care, actually, about how much magic is in the world. Um, it There is a lot of interaction between magic and green skins that is finagly and difficult to parse out um so maybe they'd be bigger but it it wouldn't necessarily be like you know it, they wouldn't be like mountain sized or anything um what's the biggest most powerful wa ever uh debatably grom some might argue that it was the wa that sigmar defeated led by vorbad was that Vorbat Iron Jar or was that the one Carl Franz beat? I always get them confused, so I refuse to confirm or deny it's one or the other. Yeah, it's, one, it's one of those. But it's the one Sigmar, the one either either the one Sigmar fought or Groms. Um yeah. okay, last or, uh, last question. Um which um would it would the dwarves have likely been to help the elves with Grom? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Um, all right, and that's it. So, uh, Ryan Woodell, has Andy seen the Warden in the Ponch trailer? Um, I don't think so, but I... Yes, I have. Oh, yeah, you have? That one. That, yeah, I, indeed, I own the DLC. Um, that was back when I was still playing when that one came out. So, uh, yes, I've seen that one. Oh, um, although, I barely remember it. Um, it's, it's, it was a while it's, ago. It's the Dark I've, Knight Batman versus... Uh, uh, Eltharian versus Mad Max Grom. I, I think that shows how little I remember it. Because I was like, it is? Awesome! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's 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 honestly one of their best trailers. Like it's oh, the music. Oh, yeah, have to go look at it. yeah. Uh, I promise I'll make Andy watch it. Uh and maybe maybe we'll talk about it very briefly to start next stream. But we're out of time. Uh we we just hit we, are. we just hit time. So that was a lot of fun. I enjoy Grom. Yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Uh hope you all really, really enjoyed the stream. This was a lot of fun. Uh talking about Grom is fantastic because there's a lot of really fun little sneak things in there. Uh um, is, isn't there? Yes, but uh, just a couple, uh, very brief reminder that next week is on Andy's channel. For the love of God, people, we we alternate weeks, <laughs> so it'll be on Lawhammer next week because we've I have been bumping into people that are like, oh, like I didn't see this one. When y'all do it? It's like it's because it's we we do one on Lawhammer, then we do one here, then we do one on Lawhammer, then we do one here. So absolutely, uh, make sure you subscribe over there so you know when it's happening. But uh, I do want to give a very special thank you to everyone who showed up today. I believe we broke a new record for live viewers today. Uh, we actually capped over 500 people, which is fucking insane. We do. Um, so the, It's not the, the biggest. The biggest we had live was the End Times one. No, not the End Times one. It was the one before that. Because we had we had almost 600 running around at one point. Oh, God. Was that, um, the, was that the Dragon uh, Kids one? Dragon Kids, that's oh, yeah. what it was. Yeah, there was Dragon a relevant, Kids. There was a relevant DLC. Good old Dragon Kids. That was awesome. Random topic on a random week. This was yes. a record. Uh, Thank you so, so much for turning up. That's just amazing. Um, it's really nice. We appreciate it's all the support. Farming. Yeah, it we means do. the world to us. Um, we really, really think that y'all are able to allow us to do this, and it's really been a really successful venture and uh, hopefully just continues to be so. And at some point in my life, I'll try and think of a way we can do like fun weird merch or something for lord beards i don't know what the fuck what but uh we'll figure something out at some point anyway thank you for watching i'm gonna stop rambling now bye-bye <laughs> <laughs> bye-bye we'll see you next week over on the little hammer channel uh maybe maybe it might be at a, di a different day um oh, we might have scheduling conflict we'll just, just um, be we'll aware the 26th yeah we'll put up the news very soon yeah well we'll let and you know it's, it's the week after that i have scheduling conflict so next oh, so week next will week be on good. my channel okay, yeah, okay. Next week we're good. we'll see you next week all right bye <laughs> see you next week all right bye bye <laughs>